1992, the now defunct Midway Games released the first in what would become one of the most famous franchises in video game history. Mortal Kombat today may be known for blood, guts, bones, violence, and brutality, but 26 years ago, things were just getting started. Over the next several months, we are going to cover the entire history of Mortal Kombat, from the arcades to the home consoles and damn near everything in between. There is plenty of blood to spill, stories to be told, and secrets to uncover, so we will waste no time and jump right into 1992 with the first game in the series. If you've been living under a rock for almost 30 years, I know what you might be thinking. What is Mortal Kombat? What the hell does it all mean? Why are these people fighting? Well, here's the deal. Earthrealm's warriors are defending the entire planet from the bad guys of Outworld, who are trying to win a fighting tournament and seize control, which would be the end of everything as we know it. You got it? Each of the game's seven characters has their own personal story and motivations for participating in the tournament. For example, we're told in his biography and ending that Sub-Zero is a member of the Lin Kuei Ninja Clan, and he was only competing in the tournament to kill Shang Tsung, as he was paid an insane amount of money to do so. On the other end, we're told Scorpion is from the rival clan to Sub-Zero's. His ending reveals that he was murdered by Sub-Zero before the tournament ever began, and that his demons have resurrected him as a specter in order to gain revenge. Of course, it's not really all that simple, as Sub-Zero's ending isn't canonical to the story, and he was not the one to win the tournament. I mean, Scorpion didn't win it either, but his ending of murdering Sub-Zero out of revenge is canon. This is only the beginning of how hard this all is to follow, but stick with me. There are five other playable characters to choose from outside of the two ninjas. We've got Kano, the Black Dragon mercenary. We've got his nemesis, Special Forces agent Sonya Blade. There's the God of Thunder, Raiden. Johnny Cage is a talented martial artist turned dickheaded Hollywood actor. And Liu Kang, the Shaolin monk who would go on to defeat Shang Tsung and win the tournament, saving Earthrealm. Mortal Kombat stood out immediately in arcades not just for its gratuitous use of violence, but for its graphical style. Characters in the game don't look anything like the cartoon characters of its main competitor Street Fighter 2, as Mortal Kombat's fighters are all real people. This style was achieved by digitizing each individual movement from real-life actors in a studio and placing the photographs into the game. It may not look like much now, but in 1992, this shit was insane. One of my fondest memories in my near 30 years of existence on this planet is the first time I ever saw the pit. Fighting to the death on a bridge no more than three feet wide is a terrifying prospect to begin with. But it wasn't until the fight ended that I found out just how terrifying it could be. Johnny Cage wins. This is an event I would mimic each and every time I play with my action figures for the rest of my childhood. The pit isn't just scary and brutal, it's fucking iconic. But knocking your opponent into the pit is not the only way to brutally finish a fight in Mortal Kombat. No way! Remember those seven characters we talked about earlier? All of them have their own distinct finishing move. I'm talking, of course, about fatalities. Whether you're ripping someone's head off with the spinal cord still attached, or tearing their still beating heart out of their chest, these finishing moves are one of the driving forces behind what makes Mortal Kombat so special. It's one thing to beat your friend's ass when they thought they could take you down, but it's another thing entirely when you punch their fucking head right off their body. Johnny Cage wins. Fatalities are the ultimate period on the end of the sentence, and I'll never forget the very few times I was able to pull them off as a kid. You gotta remember, there was no internet back then. You couldn't just Google, how do I do a fatality? Because there was no Google. You had to go out to recess with your friends and tell them that you were button mashing and you blew a kiss to Sonya and your opponent's skin burned off. And half the time they wouldn't believe you, but that's the way it goes. Not everybody thought fatalities were awesome, though. The focus was on video games. Under pressure from an angry Congress and angrier parents, game makers offered a new rating system. The timing of the peace offering was no accident. Just an hour later, the Senate began hearings on new legislation to prevent violent games from reaching kids. It is a sick, disgusting video game, in my judgment. 
shame on people that produce that trash. It's child abuse in my judgment. The Entertainment Software Ratings Board, or ESRB, cracked down hard and changed the way it handled ratings in large part to how gnarly some of the fatalities were. It could have been awful. It could have led to video games being censored and changed to protect consumers. But luckily, that didn't happen. Oh wait, yeah it did. The Super Nintendo version of Mortal Kombat was stripped down to the bones and not in a cool way. Blood was replaced with sweat and fatalities were swapped with censored finishing moves. For instance, Sub-Zero doesn't rip his opponent's head off on the Super Nintendo. Instead, he just, he just punches them really hard. The Sega Genesis version came complete with the blood code. Entering ABACABB at the title screen turns on all of the fantastic violence you bought the game for in the first place. Side note, the Super Nintendo version still has the pit, and you can still knock your opponent off the bridge. And when they hit the bottom, there's no blood. Are they insinuating that your opponent missed all of the goddamn spikes? Get the fuck out of here. Each and every level looks different and gives an awesome sense of progression. The courtyard gives us our first look at the boss, Shang Tsung, as he watches our fight from his throne. The palace gates looks like it leads directly to the courtyard, and the warrior shrine shows the passage of time, as the night sky has drowned out the shining sun from earlier levels. Test Your Might, Test your might is a minigame that pops up after every third win in single player mode. The goal is to mash the absolute dog shit out of the face buttons and slam the block button down once you've raised your might high enough to destroy the object in front of you. There are five objects of increasing difficulty, measuring from wood, to stone, to steel, to ruby, to diamond. Good luck with the diamond, and good luck with the blisters you're going to get trying to break all of these items. Shang Tsung may be the final boss of the game, but his sub-boss underling is where it's at for me. The four-armed half-man, half-dragon Shokan Prince Goro haunted my nightmares for years. While every other character was a real person whose movements were captured in a studio, Goro was actually captured using a clay model and stop-motion animation. Which, I guess isn't all that surprising, seeing as though there's no living human with four fucking arms. Mortal Kombat wasn't always called Mortal Kombat, which is kind of a weird thing to think about. According to series creator Ed Boon, the names Kumite, Dragon Attack, Death Blow, and Fatality were all considered at one point. It wasn't until Steve Ritchie, a pinball designer, was in Boon's office that the official name took hold. He saw the word combat written on a sheet of paper and said, Why don't you just call it Mortal Kombat? The title stuck. But why spell it with a K? Well. A Midway employee drew a K over the C in combat as a goof, and that stuck too. Who would have imagined it was that simple? Another interesting piece of history comes in the shape of Jean-Claude Van Damme, the man Mortal Kombat was initially based on. No, Van Damme wasn't supposed to be in Mortal Kombat. Midway initially wanted to make a game entirely centered around him. Things didn't work out, but hey, that's the way it goes. At least they have Johnny Cage, the dickheaded actor guy who wears black tights with a red sash, and does a split into a dick punch. I don't know, maybe Midway was a little bitter. Mortal Kombat and secrets go together like lamb and tuna fish. Lamb and tuna fish? Maybe you like spaghetti and meatball? Be more comfortable with that analogy? Hidden levels, characters, and fatalities, they're all mainstays of the series, and it all started with Reptile the green ninja who randomly appears and delivers cryptic, sometimes subliminal message to the player on how to find him. The key to battling Reptile is to watch for an obstruction to pass by the moon when fighting at the pit. If you're skilled enough to pull off a double flawless victory with a fatality, Reptile will appear and challenge you to a fight at the corpse littered bottom of the pit. Reptile is extremely fast and possesses the special moves of both Sub-Zero and Scorpion. Defeating him earns the player 10 million points. Several glitches can be exploited in the game, mostly during fatalities. If your timing is right and you're playing as Johnny Cage, you can uppercut your opponent's head off more than once. If you're Sub-Zero, try performing your fatality as Raiden is in the process of getting back to his feet. 
His head comes off just fine, but the rest of his body stays blue as it was caught mid-animation. Try these out for yourself, they're oddly satisfying. Oh, no, September 13th, 1993 was dubbed Mortal Monday and marked the home console releases of Mortal Kombat on Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, Game Gear, and Game Boy. Mortal Kombat took the world by storm. The arcades were making in obscene amounts of money before the home console release ever happened. The first game sold more than 2.5 million units on Sega Genesis alone. Fans were clamoring for more, and it did not take long for a sequel to find its way home. Mortal Kombat 2 hit arcades in April of 1993, bringing with it faster gameplay, more blood, more characters, and a darker aesthetic to coincide with the game's new setting. The game takes place in Outworld, giving Shao Kahn the home field advantage. Who the fuck is Shao Kahn, you may ask? Shao Kahn is the emperor of Outworld. After Liu Kang beat Shang Tsung in the original tournament, Shao Kahn wanted to execute him for his failures and for being responsible for the apparent death of Laura. The game's intro explains that Khan only spared Shang Tsung after he devised a plan to lure Earthrealm's fighters into Khan's homeland, where he'd have the advantage in hopes of winning the second tournament and continuing their plan to take over Earthrealm. The new setting of Outworld gives Mortal Kombat 2 a completely different look from its predecessor. The sunny skies and brightly colored flags and banners are nowhere to be found, replaced instead by crumbling stone, burning effigies, chaotic skies, scorching pools of acid, and a forest full of trees that have taken on seemingly human faces. Joining the action in MK2 are Kitana, Melina, Kung Lao, Boraka, and Jax. The only characters not playable from MK1 are Sonya and Kano, although they do appear in the background of the Khan's Arena stage. Ed Boon stated that Kano and Sonya were removed simply because they were the least used characters from the original game, which is understandable. Alongside the aforementioned five debuting fighters, Shang Tsung and Reptile are now fully playable. Shang Tsung's change in appearance is explained in the intro, stating that Shao Kahn restored the sorcerer's youth, giving him a second chance to stop Earthrealm's fighters. Kintaro is the game's sub-boss, another four-armed Shokan. He sports a tiger stripe design, and was actually supposed to be a bipedal tiger of sorts, but it was determined that a poseable figure of that nature was going to be too hard to pull off. Mortal Kombat 2 takes the cryptic and secretive nature of the first game and turns that shit up to 11. Reptile kept us guessing in Mortal Kombat 1, but who the fuck is that green chick here in MK2? Where does this weird portal go? And wait, who was that great ninja back there? I'm about to tell you some secrets. The green mystery woman isn't just a female reptile, no sir. Her name is Jade, and to uncover her, you've got to win the fight right before the question mark on the arcade ladder using only low kick. This is way harder than it sounds, trust me. To answer the portal question of where does that lead to, well, it leads to Earthrealm. Or, more specifically, Goro's Lair from the first game. To enter the portal, you have to land an uppercut on your opponent. And if some weird fucker pops out of the corner of the screen and shouts, You gotta hurry up! Press down and start before he disappears, and you'll be met with a challenge from an undiscovered warrior from Mortal Kombat 1. Smoke is another palette swap ninja, joining the ranks of Sub-Zero, Scorpion, and Reptile. Similar to Reptile from the first game, he's fast as fuck and shows a moveset with Scorpion. This next secret fighter is either the most difficult to discover or the least difficult to discover, depending on whether you do it by the book. What are the requirements, you ask? Oh, not much. Just win 50 fights in a row. This sounds impossible, I know. But you can just plug it in two controllers and cheat the shit out of it if you want. That's where the buy the book part comes in. Round one, fight. Noob Saibot lacks any definition to his character model and appears to be made only of the void, only of shadows and emptiness. He has Sub-Zero's stance and victory pose, but possesses Scorpion's spear move. The identity of all three of these secret characters are kept mostly under wraps, but we'll touch more on them later in the series. Side note. Noob Saibot is Boon Tobias backwards for Ed Boon and John Tobias.
I stated earlier that MK2 brought more violence to the table, and holy shit, that might be a bit of an understatement. Some of the new fatalities here make Sub-Zero's head ripping from the first game look like child's play. I think the nastiest ones by far are Jax ripping his opponent's arms off. Jax wins. Reptile tearing off and eating his opponent's entire head. Reptile wins. And Kung Lao brutally slicing his opponent's body down the middle, splitting them like cattle in a meat factory. Wins. Flawless victory. Fatality. That is fucking nasty. Every level has something sinister about it. There's dripping lava, trees with sharp teeth, sketchy cliffs in the background. There's all sorts of nasty shit going on here. Your mind would go wild at the endless possibilities wondering just what the hell you might be able to pull off with the right button combination. There are three distinct stage fatalities in Mortal Kombat 2, ranging from the Deadpool, to the Combat Tomb, to the Pit 2. The Deadpool is a thin walkway suspended over sizzling dark pools of green acid. Knocking your opponent into the toxic wastes melts their skin off instantaneously. Fatality. The combat tomb is a claustrophobic stone setting with an eerily low hanging ceiling. That's not gonna be good for business. That's not gonna be good for anybody. The Pit 2 is especially scary. How do you improve on a classic? The Pit 2 is way, way higher off the ground, so the fall is much scarier. But there are no spikes at the bottom. Instead, sharp, jagged rocks await any poor bastard unlucky enough to lose a fight atop the bridge. Kitana wins. Flawless victory. Fatality. It wasn't all blood and guts, though. Babalities and friendships were introduced in Mortal Kombat 2 to give you a way to humiliate your friends after beating them without brutally killing them. Who wouldn't want to turn their sore loser friend into a little itty bitty crybaby? Liu Kang wins. Babality. And leave it to Shang Tsung to bring a little color to the otherwise drab and macabre lands of Outworld. Wins. Friendship. Friendship. The rumor mills were working overtime in Mortal Kombat 2, that's a fact. See those two guys fighting back there? Players went insane wondering who these guys were. Fans figured that the green guy was named Hornbuckle after misinterpreting cryptic hints dropped by Smoke and Jade, when in reality the name simply referred to a woman found in the game's credits. The Man on Fire was originally nicknamed Torch by curious players. Interestingly enough, Torch was later turned into a full-on canonical character in the series, taking on the name Blades. It turns out he was actually a pretty fucking big deal, as we'll talk about in great detail later in the series. The canonical ending to Mortal Kombat 2 is Liu Kang's ending. With Shao Kahn defeated and disgraced, Liu Kang returns to the seclusion of his Shaolin Temple. He pays his respects to his lost brothers and finally realizes that the events which have taken place were all the fulfillment of his destiny. Mortal Kombat 2 released on home consoles on September 9th, 1994, which Midway dubbed as Mortal Friday. Inside of the first few weeks, console sales were already over 2.5 million units. MK2 was proclaimed the best-selling video game in the world up to that point. But what comes next? You will never win. Mortal Kombat 3 released on April 15, 1995 and changed the MK formula quite a bit. Combatants all had individually programmed combos this time around, making each character feel much more unique than both games prior. The long-rumored animality finishing move was introduced in Mortal Kombat 3, but could only be pulled off after you've shown mercy to your opponent in the third round. Some of the greatest animalities included Cyrax turning into a great white shark, Kano delivering a deadly bite as a tarantula, and Stryker morphing into a T-Rex and biting his opponent clean in half, because why not? Not all of them are cool, though. Why the fuck does Smoke turn into a Shadow Bull? And why does Shiva turn into a Scorpion, rather than fucking Scorpion turning into a Scorpion? Oh, maybe because Scorpion isn't in the game. 
Now might be the time to elaborate on some of those changes I mentioned earlier, the changes that really shook up the MK formula. Combos and finishing moves weren't the only noticeable differences. For the first and only time in Mortal Kombat's history, Scorpion is not in the game. He's arguably the franchise's most popular figure, and he's nowhere to be found. Let's take a look at this character select screen, because it's a fucking doozy. We've still got Shang Tsung, Liu Kang, Jax, Sonya, Kung Lao, and the returning Kano, so there are recognizable faces. But who the fuck is that guy? Oh, that's Sub-Zero. His mask is gone and his appearance is totally different, but I guess if we beat Mortal Kombat 2 as Sub-Zero, we'd have known he was going to change. But who are these other people? Sindel is Shao Kahn's queen, who was dead before he resurrected her solely to do his bidding. Stryker is a riot control officer who was on duty when the Outworld portals opened up over his city. Cyrax and Sector are cyborg ninjas built by the Lin Kuei with one purpose, to kill Sub-Zero, who has gone rogue, which explains his change in costume. Nightwolf is a Native American dude who is extremely protective of his tribe's land, so protective that he's willing to fight Shao Kahn to protect it. Shiva represents the Shokan just like Goro and Kentaro before her, and Cabal is a mystery man who was horrifically scarred during an Outworld attack. His mask has artificial respirators built into it, and without them, he would die. Side note, Cyrax and Sector were initially called Mustard and Ketchup before they were given official names. The fighters themselves weren't the only area where things visually evolved either. Mortal Kombat 1's levels all had a strong Asian flavor to them. In Mortal Kombat 2, we shifted to Outworld, a setting full of odd forms and somber tapestry. In Mortal Kombat 3, things look much more familiar. We're fighting on city streets, in modern churches, in the goddamn subway? But how did we get here? What happened? The basic plot of Mortal Kombat 3 is this. Shao Kahn realizes he might be fucked after eating back-to-back -back losses in the last two tournaments, and he cooks up a scheme that allows him to travel to Earthrealm and basically take it by force, stealing the souls of billions of innocent people in the process. Outworld and Earthrealm are fusing into one dimension, which explains why Khan's tower can be seen looming in the background of certain seemingly earthly settings. Another brand new feature comes in the shape of a run button, which allows for faster movement and affects your ability to perform combos. Connecting with an uppercut in certain levels will send your opponent flying so high that they'll break through the ceiling and into a new area. This was an awesome feature to take advantage of any time you played with friends. The cat and mouse game of landing a nasty uppercut was definitely an MK3 highlight. A well-trained ear will also notice that the music changes from screen to screen. <laughs> Difficulty levels for arcade mode make their debut in the shape of Choose Your Destiny. Choose Your Destiny. For real grimy badasses, always aim for the highest level, and are usually humbled quicker than they can say, Oh, I fucked up. Stage fatalities became a staple for the series in Mortal Kombat 2, and there was no way to make Mortal Kombat 3 without bringing them back. But what kind of hazards can we find in a modern city setting? Well, you can knock your opponent onto the subway tracks and have them run over by a train, for one. The bell tower hazard sees your opponent falling through six floors before they're skewered on basement spikes that are at least seven feet long. Hold on, why the fuck are there giant spikes in the basement of this bell tower? Who built this place? And last but not least, we've got the Pit 3. The longest fall of them all and arguably the most sinister surprise at the bottom. That's fucked up. Cyrax wins. Unlike the first two games, who feature four-armed Shokans as their sub-bosses, Mortal Kombat 3 introduces the centaur, Motaro. He's immune to projectile attacks and even bounces some of them back at the player for having the audacity to try attacking him. Like his sub-boss brethren before him, Motaro was also animated using stop-motion technology. Playing multiplayer matches gave you the opportunity to enter combat codes. Players use the face buttons to try and correctly input a code that can either allow you to fight secret characters, play as Smoke, or even unlock the 1981 arcade classic Galaga. This may be blasphemous to some hardcore Mortal Kombat fans out there, and don't get me wrong, I'm one of you, but I don't particularly like Mortal Kombat 3. I was never able to fully master the combo system, and while I don't think the roster sucks, it's also far from the best they've ever done, and 
While the soundtrack is great, the levels themselves don't really do a whole lot for me. I just wish there was a way that Midway could have expanded on Mortal Kombat 3 and we wouldn't have... Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3 released in November of 1995, barely six months after the release of the original version. This updated version adds missing characters like Reptile, Katana, Jade, and Scorpion, as well as unlockable secret characters like Classic Sub-Zero, Ermac, Melina, and Human Smoke. Rumors exploded through arcades and classrooms over the mysterious purple ninja named Rain in the game's attract mode. Although players tried and tried to figure out a way to either fight him or play as him, it was all in vain, as Rain isn't really in the game at all. Ed Boon slipped him into the game's attract mode simply to stir up rumors and to tip his cap to one of his favorite musicians. He's a purple ninja named Rain, and he's the prince of Edenia. You get it? If you don't, lose my number. The ultimate version of the game didn't just add missing characters or red herrings, though. Two-on-two -two combat brings an entirely new layer of fun to the multiplayer side of things, and the AI was highly improved for the single-player portion of the game. Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3 closed the original trilogy in style, introducing new gameplay mechanics and ways- Jesus Christ, this isn't going to end, is it? Mortal Kombat Trilogy dropped one year after Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3, bringing together all of the characters from the first three games into one giant, bloody, fatality fuckfest. It was the first Mortal Kombat game to not have an arcade release. It was also the first time that Shao Kahn, Goro, Kentaro, Motaro, and Human Smoke were all natively playable. And not to be left out in the mystery department, the game adds a new secret character named Chameleon, a ninja who rapidly changes stance and color and shares the moveset of every ninja in the game. To sum it up, he's fucking awesome. Mortal Kombat Trilogy was a massive success, achieving even greater sales than Mortal Kombat 3 before it. With three entries in the series, one expansion, and a compilation game inside of just four years, Mortal Kombat was about to expand, shifting into an entirely different dimension. In the short span of 1992 to 1996, developer Midway Games released five distinct titles in the Mortal Kombat franchise. In the same amount of time, only one game was released under the Legend of Zelda umbrella. A lone entry in the Metroid series saw the light of day. Mortal Kombat 3 was met with review scores lower than those of the previous installments, and by the time the compilation title, Mortal Kombat Trilogy, hit store shelves, Fatality was close to being replaced by another big and bad F-word, Fatigue. Ed Boon and company needed something huge to rattle the MK landscape, and they found it by traveling to another dimension. The third My first memory of Mortal Kombat 4 is both extremely blurry and quite vivid at the same time. I don't know why I was at an ice rink, as I've never skated, but there I was, at an ice rink. I was roaming the halls and looking for the pinball tables and arcade games that used to be standard in every bowling alley or roller rink when I spotted it. A game I'd never seen before, with some dude who looked like a bald version of Sting on the side of the cabinet. I curiously turned the corner and faced the monitor just in time to see some poor bastard get impaled on spikes after falling down a well. It was unmistakable. This was Mortal Kombat. The character select screen was overwhelming. There were the old faithfuls, debuting faces, and for the first time since 1993, a brand new final boss in the fallen elder god, Shinnok. I'll never forget my brother walking up behind me and saying, Shinnok? Like the fish? Who is Chinook? The brand new 3D graphics blew me away. I was used to playing arcade games like Rampage and NBA Jam. I had never seen anything that looked as good as Mortal Kombat 4. The levels all had their own distinct feel and color palette. The characters had muscle definition, different shades, and the wrinkles of their outfits. I almost died of sensory overload when I saw Scorpion's new toasty fatality for the first time. Are you insane? That still looks good. Scorpion wins. Fatality. For the first time in the series, beating the arcade mode with the character of your choice doesn't just lead to static images with text on the bottom of the screen. Instead, we're treated to sharp looking cutscenes full of 3D violence, character development, and in depth looks at the levels we don't get during gameplay. 
The cutscenes also feature some of the worst voice acting in video game history, and just as a small taste of that, here's a little chunk of Jax's ending video. <laughs> going somewhere, Jarek? Jax! I thought you were going to. Thought I was what? Dead? Like my heart being just tossed off the cliff? I'm I'm sorry, Jax. Please, don't drop me. Wait, I, I promise. Too late, Jarek. You can't drop me. You have to uphold the law. You, you have to arrest me. Wait, wait, this is brutality. You can't do it. Wrong, Jarek. This is not a brutality. This is a fatality. <laughs> That is awful. Everybody knows how bad the voice acting is in the original Resident Evil. Whoa! This hall is dangerous! There must be a back door somewhere. And I'd actually say that Mega Man 8 is a little worse than Resident Evil. We may be able to locate another energy emission from the radar room. When we find that media, we'll find Dr. Wally. But Mortal Kombat 4 is right there with them. It's not quite House of the Dead 2 level of bullshit, but it's real close. Goldman, do you know what you're doing? I'm fully aware of what I'm doing. Can't you see? Babalities and friendships are noticeably absent from MK4, and this was done on purpose, as series creator Ed Boon stated that he wanted to ditch the silliness of his predecessors. Mortal Kombat was always known for its violent fatalities, but MK4 introduces a new grapple move called Bone Breakers that I personally find harder to watch than some of the finishing moves. In the middle of a fight, a single button press allows you to break your opponent's neck like Steven Seagal, hyperextend their knee with a brutal stomp, or deliver an uppercut to the elbow, popping it right out of the socket. This was a turning point in the series where it was decided that no injury is enough to inconvenience a fighter for more than a second and a half, even if they're dealing with a probable compound fracture. Just whip that bone right back into shape and you're good to go, right? Evolution didn't occur only on the graphical side of things, but in the story as well. Shao Kahn is beaten and gone. Shinnok has escaped from the Netherrealm as the new dickhead in charge of a whole new team of bad guys. And some of our beloved tried and true favorites have completely new looks. Goro has returned, and Reptile is nearly unrecognizable, having completely shed his human disguise. He's slowly reverting back to his true Zaterran form, but more on that later. Weapon combat led the charge for Mortal Kombat 4's marketing campaign. One of the posters read, Hand-to-hand -hand combat was only the beginning. The game's entire opening cinematic talks only about weapon combat. The crushing pound of the mallet. The shattering blow of the club. The slashing edge of the blade. They call to you. Pulling out your fighter's sword, axe, mace, boomerang, or whatever the hell else you might have is simple. Just punch in a button combination no more difficult than throwing Scorpion Spear or Sub-Zero's Ice Blast. Weapons do great damage, but honestly, they're pretty hard to use. You might call that a plus on the balancing side of things, as you don't want weapons to give you an unfair advantage, but more often than not, you won't be able to land more than a hit or two before your opponent knocks the weapon away. One single punch or kick will send it flying through the air. And if you drop it, they can use it, so be careful. Weapons aren't the only hazard on the stage though. Severed heads and giant rocks cause way more damage than the average attack, so make sure you use them to your full advantage. Speaking of using something to its full advantage, they finally got it right. Remember when I complained about Shiva turning into a scorpion for her animality in Mortal Kombat 3? And why does Shiva turn into a scorpion rather than fucking Scorpion turning into a scorpion? Well, they got it right this time. And it looks fucking awesome. And while we're at it, let's appreciate the 3D evolution of Liu Kang's dragon fatality as well. Ouch. Every MK game has something silly about it. 
MK4 may have removed babalities and friendships, but that's not to say nothing in the game is funny. Listen closely to certain characters and see if you can hear the weird shit that comes out of their mouths, like, Oh, I'm gonna throw you over there! Oh, I'm gonna throw you over there! Oh, God! I imagine the developers giggling like little kids as they slip these in, knowing that they were gonna throw players for a loop. What Mortal Kombat 4 adds on the graphical side of things is substantial, but what it lacks in other areas is just as noteworthy. Mortal Kombat 1, 2, and 3 were all down and dirty fighting games, sure. But it was the mysteries in each of those games that kept you coming back even after you'd beaten the arcade ladder with every character. In MK1, the shapes pass by the moon, Reptile appears and delivers cryptic messages. MK2 has smoke and jade peeking from behind the trees in the living forest, and unplayable characters in the backgrounds of certain stages. MK3 has the smoke block and Cyrax stuck in the sand. What's he doing out there? Mortal Kombat 4, on the other hand, has... nothing, really. The feeling of undiscovered secrets around every corner is completely missing, and it sucks. Sure, there are hidden fighters like Noob Saibot and Meat, and you can switch your costume with the button press of the character select screen, but the environmental clues are what's missing. Mortal Kombat and Mystery are synonymous with each other, and having one without the other here just doesn't feel right. Two years after the release of Mortal Kombat 4, the game popped up on Sega Dreamcast, this time known as Mortal Kombat Gold. Classic characters like Baraka, Kung Lao, Cyrax, Sektor, Melina, and Katana were added to the game, accompanied by brand new cutscenes, but it wasn't enough to win over the hearts and minds of players and critics around the world, the majority of which condemned the game, saying it felt slow, dated, and lacked any real depth. Mortal Kombat 4 nowadays is seen as the worst mainline game in the series. I personally don't agree with that, and we're not talking about the spin-offs like mythologies or special forces, though we are going to cover those soon, but it seemed like Midway had started to feel the fatigue as well. After pumping out seven games between 1992 and 1996, the team finally took a breather. It would be five years before we saw another mainline release in the Mortal Kombat franchise. 1999 saw an image of the number 5 posted on Ed Boon's website with Scorpion's face inside of it, teasing fans around the world with a looming sequel announcement. The fifth main entry in the Mortal Kombat series was supposed to hit arcades in 2000, though it never did, officially marking the end of the arcade era. Initially titled Mortal Kombat 5 Vengeance, the game would miss the projected 2000 mark by more than two years before finally being unveiled with a teaser trailer. The trailer showed off a gigantic graphical leap for Mortal Kombat 4, which was expected, seeing as though this was the first Mortal Kombat game on the next generation of consoles. MK hype was at an all-time high when the game released later that year. My buddy Bathroom Money Tim Ewers and I could not wait to sink our teeth into the newest chapter of Mortal Kombat, and the shock that we were left with after watching the opening cinematic the first time sticks with me to this day. See, there are things you come to expect with a franchise you love. Mario will always save the princess. Michael Myers will always go on a rampage and then seemingly die at the end of each Halloween movie. And Liu Kang will always lead the heroes of Earthrealm to victory in Mortal Kombat. In Deadly Alliance, Liu Kang and company are up against two foes they previously defeated, in Shang Tsung and Quan Chi. The two sorcerers launch a sneak attack on Liu while he's training, and even though he puts up a fight, their combined strength is a huge obstacle. Just when Shang Tsung has our champion right where he wants him, we know what's coming, it's so predictable. Who is coming to save the day, huh? Liu Kang is dead. What the, what the fuck, fuck just, just happened? happened? Our entire world came crashing down around us. We're sitting there, two 11, 12-year-old kids, can't wait to play our new game, and the main hero gets fucking killed right in front of us before we even start playing. We were crushed. We were blown away from the get-go. But hey, that's what the team at Midway wanted. We've spoken previously about franchise fatigue, and what better way to signify the rebirth of a property than to take the established star and say, fuck him, he's dead. Deadly Alliance features 3D gameplay that feels so much more natural compared to that of MK4, but it also introduces fighting styles. Each warrior has three distinct styles that can be cycled through by simply tapping the L1 button. Weapon combat returns as well, though this time it comes in the shape of your character's third fighting style. 
Each style has its own simple and combination attacks, and using L1 as a transition in the middle of a combo can link attacks from all three of your styles into one devastating flurry. Side note, certain weapons feature a special impale attack that allows you to embed your weapon into your opponent's body, causing bleeding damage throughout the entire battle. How fucking cool is that? What I'm about to say is more opinion than fact, and feel free to disagree with me, let me know in the comments below, but I have to think that Deadly Alliance has some of the worst fatalities in the entire series. Sure, there are cool fatalities in the game, no doubt. Scorpion finally incorporating his spear into a finishing move is great. Scorpion wins. Fatality. And Sub-Zero upping the ante and going fully literal on his classic spine rip is dope as hell. But what the fuck is with Quan Chi's neck stretching fatality? Are you kidding me? He fucking ripped your leg off and beat you to death with it in MK4. And now he's turning people into broke ass human giraffes? How about Li Mei? She kicks you really hard and then... She... Kicks you really hard again. Super creative, guys. Not only are the fatalities by and large the most disappointing in the series yet, but every character now only has one fatality to their name. I know what you're thinking. What about stage fatalities? Well, what about stage fatalities? None of the characters have them, because for the first time since the beginning of MK, there are no stage fatalities. What Deadly Alliance lacks on the fatality front, it attempts to make up for in the minigames department. For the first time since MK1, Test Your Might is back. Trying to smash the diamond will still give you blisters. And following the MK logo in the new Test Your Sight minigame will make you dizzier than shit being spun on a ceiling fan. Coming out victorious in battle or in these minigames earns you coins that can be spent in the brand new Crypt, which houses the game's unlockable content. The crypt contains exactly 676 coffins in a 26 by 26 AA to ZZ format. Each coffin costs a certain amount of coins to open, and once open, there is no going back, so choosing wisely is of peak importance. Coffins contain anything from cool concept art, to alternate costumes, to unlockable characters. There are several different types of currency in the game, which can make earning the required amount to open certain coffins quite tedious. But I understand the idea, it extends the time you're going to spend with the game. And hey, you do not want to miss some of the shit housed in these coffins. UI contains Cooking with Scorpion, a comedy video my friends and I would watch at each and every sleepover. Chopping, cake decorating, and chopping. And you know what's in coffin FU? Fuck you, that's what. Conquest Mode is another brand new feature that debuts in Deadly Alliance. It's a bare bones version of what the mode will become in later installments, and it doesn't come close to feeling like a fleshed out and complete idea. Learn mastery of each and every warrior and uncover secrets of their past. That sounds pretty kick ass, right? Well, it's not. Conquest Mode is really just an extended tutorial mode with text based story details in between loading screen after loading screen. It's not a bad way to earn coins for the crypt, and it is cool to get some detail on our favorite fighters' ongoing storylines, but this just doesn't quite hit the mark. I'm not saying it's a waste of time, but it's far from a highlight in the series. As usual, we've got a good mix of old and new faces on the roster. Debuting this time around are Frost, Dramen, Moloch, Kenshi, and Bo Raicho, among others, and we've got secret fighters in the shape of Mocap and Blaze. Remember Blaze from Mortal Kombat 2? Here we are, nine years later, and the rumor has come to life. Just wait until Armageddon when we see the real Blaze. Not every new character was a home run though, as some are quite forgettable. Su Hao debuts as another Kano-ish clone like Jarek before him, though he is a member of the Red Dragon, which is a feuding faction to Kano's Black Dragon. Li Mei is an outworld rebel who is just kind of... there. See what I mean? What sucks is that these characters made the final roster, while several other debuting fighters were left on the cutting room floor. Baphomet was meant to be the first Elder Demon, and was based on an actual centuries-old satanic legend. T 
Tiamat was a lizard-based fighter who we don't have much background on. All we know for sure is that when he was scrapped, many of his characteristics were transferred to Reptile, who continues to visually devolve into his true Zaterran form. Other cut characters can be researched online, each accompanied by less and less information about what they were supposed to be. It's possible that several of them didn't make it past a concept sketch, but it's fun to wonder what could have been. Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance released two great reviews, great sales, but most importantly, above all, it breathed desperately needed new life into the franchise. The rebirth of MK had been achieved, and it opened up a whole new world of possibilities regarding where the series could go next. The May 2003 issue of PlayStation Magazine revealed the first word on Mortal Kombat 6, the game that would eventually become Mortal Kombat Deception. Deadly Alliance set the bar for what a cinematic should look like in a Mortal Kombat game, and Deception picks up that torch and runs with it. It does not disappoint. Right off the bat with Deception, we take a double punch to the stomach as we learn the fate of Earth's warriors is one of tragedy. Raiden is Earthrealm's last hope, and though he fights as hard as he can, the deadly alliance of Shang Tsung and Quan Chi are too much to handle. Even for a Thunder God. Within seconds of accomplishing their goal of resurrecting the Dragon King's unstoppable army, the Deadly Alliance implodes, and Quan Chi dispatches his former ally in seconds. She defeated Shang Tsung and reveled in his conquest. Time for celebration is cut short as Onaga, the Dragon King, has returned to regain control of his long lost army. A new alliance is formed as Quan Chi, Shang Tsung, and Raiden all join forces in an attempt to stop Onaga before it's too late. Seeing the three of them team up is shocking in its own right, but watching Onaga walk through their combined strength like it's a gentle breeze is enough to chill the spine of anybody who has ever picked up a controller. This motherfucker is nasty. Raiden, in a desperate attempt to stop Onaga, conjures up a blast powerful enough to wipe out everything within the surrounding area. The explosion kills him, Shang Tsung, Quan Chi, and countless undead soldiers, but barely leaves a scratch on the Dragon King. This not only sets up Onaga as the biggest and baddest final boss in Mortal Kombat history up to this point, but it sets up the game's all new Conquest Mode. See, this is what Conquest Mode should have been in Deadly Alliance. We're not talking about a player by player practice mode with a little bit of story text here and there, no way. Deception's Conquest mode is a full-on RPG with several different worlds to explore. We play as the debuting Shujinko, and we're tasked by a being named Damashi with traveling from realm to realm, searching for the six pieces of the Kamidogu. Who the hell is Damashi and what the hell is the Kamidogu? Well, spoiler alert Dan Dan's. Damashi is actually Onaga, and the Kamidogu are his ticket out of exile and into the game's opening cinematic. There are some damn cool things to find in Deception's Conquest mode. Fighters from previous games who aren't playable in Deception are all over the place. Seeing fighters like Motaro, Kintaro, and the like pop out of thin air offering side quests or coin prizes is a nostalgic surprise each and every time. Here, take this. Opening chests to unlock new costumes and characters feels great. And speaking to the townspeople to gather information is... Oh, well that's another story. We spoke earlier about the horrible voice acting in Mortal Kombat 4. MK4 has nothing on Deception. Deception has some of the worst, absolute worst human shit voice acting you will ever hear in a video game. Master Bo Raicho asked me to show you the other schools where he teaches martial arts. Follow me. You should go inside. I will wait for you out here. Good, you are finished. Come on, let's go to the next class. Master Boraicho's house lies to the northeast. I should head in that direction. I have never ventured to other realms, though I have always wanted to. Please, you must help me. I have lost the ring I was planning to give to my beloved. I am fairly sure that I had last had it somewhere along this riverbank. I would be grateful if you were to aid me in my search. 
There's absolutely no way that most of those people are voice actors. It was probably crunch time, they were probably gonna hit a deadline, and they just shouted down the fucking hallway, Hey, we need you! And the janitor opened his door and ran in the office and recorded the lines. I don't know how they released this game with those performances in Conquest mode. It's horrible. I'm being harsh here, but this bullshit needs to be called out. I didn't remember at all how bad this voice acting was, and holy shit was I taken aback when I popped in the game and started playing to do research for this episode. Still though, I won't let bad vocal performances overshadow what Conquest Mode is, and that's a fun little RPG set in the Mortal Kombat universe, which is really cool. It hasn't aged well, at all, but if you've never tried it out, look up some videos online. You're in for some cool shit. If RPGs aren't your cup of tea, don't worry. Deception is overflowing with new game modes, the first of which is Puzzle Combat. Imagine playing Tetris, but at the bottom of the screen are two of your favorite MK warriors duking it out. Every time you eliminate a block or a line, your super meter fills up. Supers give you an advantage, whether it's making your board a little less stressful, or adding a pinch of difficulty to your opponent's board. Winning two rounds leads to a fatality, and watching chibi Mortal Kombat characters get killed is equal parts satisfying and humorous. The other brand new game mode is Chess Combat. If you're thinking, what is it, chess but with Mortal Kombat characters? Then yeah, you're spot on. It's a cool idea, but I can't say I ever spent much actual time here. Online combat made its debut with Mortal Kombat Deception, but the servers are long since dead, so I can't really show it to you. And when I was 13 years old when this game came out, I could not even fathom hooking my PlayStation 2 up to the phone line, so obviously I never even tried it. But I bet it was good. Though it's smaller in size by around 200 coffins, the crypt does indeed return in Deception. Coffins are easier to purchase this time around thanks to Conquest Mode being a great way to earn coins. Deadly Alliance disappointed in the Fatality Department, but I am happy to report that Deception does its best to return to form. We've once again got two Fatalities per character, and for the first and only time, a Harakiri move, aka Suicide. Getting beaten by one of your buddies sucks, getting murdered by them is even worse. If you can enter your Harakiri code before they can input their fatality code, you can steal some of their thunder and take your demise into your own hands. What a nice little feature. Darius wins. Harakiri. They're not all great, and I think it's still pretty clear that there's a bit of a creativity issue when you count how many of these finishing moves have to do with different forms of decapitation. <laughs> But it's a step in the right direction. This is not counting Sindel's impression of Brock Lesnar. What the hell's Lesnar doing, Cole? Oh my god! Or Bo Raicho's impression of a TLC show, where he literally just gets so fat that he dies. Ed Boon stated before the game's release that he wanted deception to feel unpredictable. Instant death stage hazards were created to keep every fight within the player's grasp, even if they're being dominated. The Falling Cliffs level crumbles at the perimeter, sending any combatants near the edge plummeting to their gruesome death below. The Sky Temple is a multi-tiered arena. The first trap sends your opponent crashing down to another level, but after that, it's lights out. The traps in Deception are truly gruesome, whether you're being sent flying through a spiked grinding tower, crushed by a gigantic foundry press, eaten alive by piranhas, or knocked into the new 3D version of the pit. A simple power attack can trigger these traps at any time, so being mindful of your surroundings is an absolute must. Side note, it always extra freaked me out that the falling cliff spike goes right through your opponent's asshole and out their dick. Nightwolf wins flawless victory. Naturally, every combatant story progresses through deception. The new faces on the roster are largely forgettable, as half of them merely add characters to the Red Dragon vs. Black Dragon faction war that I've never given half a shit about. But there are a few key revelations here. After appearing for the first time in Mortal Kombat 2 and being shrouded in mystery ever since, Deception finally reveals the identity of Noob Saibon. The Shadow Wraith's true identity is that of Bi Han, the original Sub-Zero. 
His soul was tormented after his wrongful death at the hands of Scorpion. The reveal of his identity was 11 years in the making, and his arcade mode ending not only exposes the secret, but shows him killing his own brother. What an excellent payoff to a long-running mystery. And don't worry, him killing his younger brother is not canon. Sub-Zero comes back next time. Mortal Kombat Deception released to rave reviews and even stronger sales than Deadly Alliance before it, signifying that Mortal Kombat was stronger than ever. The 3D era breathed new life into the series, and the added features and extra game modes of Deception did not disappoint. Speaking of disappointment though, check this out. The French version of the game is called Mortal Kombat Mystification, as the word Deception roughly translates to disappointment over there. Probably for the best if they changed it. I don't think anybody would want to play a game called Mortal Kombat Disappointment. That's like buying a game called Street Fighter, eh, or Tekken, kinda shitty. That is gonna do it, Dan Dans. Thank you for joining me for this, The History of Mortal Kombat Part 2, Fatality in the Third Dimension. Next time out, we're gonna wrap up the original Mortal Kombat timeline and step into another universe. And you definitely don't want to miss that, so click that subscribe button. Keep up with everything we're doing over here at 616 Entertainment. And if you need some entertainment in between there, check out my 2017 documentary, The History of SmackDown. You can watch the full movie in one go. I love you. I appreciate you, and I will see you next time. With six main entries into the franchise and the next generation of consoles looming on the horizon, Ed Boon and Midway Games were faced with two options. They could move on to the upcoming PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 and continue to wage war, or they could use the last gasp of the PlayStation 2 generation to bring some much needed finality to the series near 15 year ongoing storyline. In issue 154 of Game Informer magazine, their decision was set in stone. Mortal Kombat Armageddon would remain on the closing current generation of consoles and release on the PlayStation 2 on October 11, 2006, just one month before the launch of the PlayStation 3. Ed Boon was quoted in the aforementioned article stating, By wrapping things up, we can move on to the next generation with the slate wiped clean. But how do you wipe the slate clean on a franchise that's been around for over 15 years with 60 plus characters, all of them with their own individual backstory? Well, it's easier than it sounds. You just fucking kill all of them. The game's opening cinematic tells the tale of what brought us here, to the end times. There have been many powerful warriors throughout the millennia. But ages of mortal combat have begun to tear the fabric of the realms. The critical point has finally been reached. This massive war is known as the Battle of Armageddon. Major players are killed left and right. Old rivalries are reignited. And, in the end, we see what awaits us at the top of the pyramid that rose from the sands. Armageddon has begun. It's fucking Blaze. We've been mentioning Blaze here and there since the history of Mortal Kombat 1 dropped a few months back. And every time I bring him up, I say, just wait and see what he'll become. Well, now's the time. Mortal Kombat is probably the only video game franchise in history that takes something that starts as a rumor and over the course of 14 years, twists and turns the possibilities until the rumor takes shape as the final boss of the game's entire universe. Where else has that ever happened? Blaze becoming, in Ed Boon's words, the top of the food chain was no accident. It's just funny that after appearing in the background of MK2 simply to add an element of mystery to the universe, and dropping hints through Deadly Alliance and Deception, that Blaze is now the ultimate embodiment of the end. What an odd and yet somehow amazing journey. At the heart of Armageddon's strengths lies the roster. Every character that has ever appeared in a Mortal Kombat game is featured, playable, and comes complete with an alternate costume. And when I say everybody, I mean everybody. Stryker is back. Kai is back. Goro, Kintaro, and Shao Kahn are all playable from the start. The Dragon King, Onaga, is here and he barely fits in the character select screen. We've even got Motaro, who- oh wait, yeah. Motaro is fucked up, unfortunately. Midway encountered major difficulties attempting to program his unique body type, 
and even considered leaving him off the roster, but ultimately decided to keep him around, even if he was a bastardized version of his former self, with only two legs. And how did they explain where the rest of his body went? Oh, uh, you know, the Shokan put a curse on him. So, that's that. Would you have preferred they just left him out? Or are you cool with the dollar store version of Motaro? Let me know in the comments. The size of the roster is astounding, especially considering each character has an alternate costume and two fighting styles. But packing so much content into this area of the game definitely came with its negatives as well, in the shape of limitations and other key modes. Fatalities, unfortunately, were hit the hardest. Gone are the days of each and every fighter having their own set of finishing moves. Fatality. In Armageddon, we're presented with a feature called Create a Fatality, where every fighter has the same set of predetermined moves which can be strung together in the order of your choice. Midway tried really hard to push this feature as being the next in the evolution of fatalities. Creative fatality takes regular fatalities to an all-time new level. You get to design your own. You get to humiliate your opponent many more times than with a regular fatality. But it really ends up falling flat and has the player wishing for the old days where every finisher was unique. Ultimate fatality. We've learned over time that fighting through the arcade ladder earns us a reward in the shape of an extra chapter in our Fighter of Choices story. In Mortal Kombat 4, we were treated to 3D videos. Deadly Alliance and Deception had fantastically designed artwork unveil itself frame by frame as the narrator told the story of what was to come. Armageddon's limitations are felt here big time, as completing the arcade ladder allows us to simply watch our chosen fighter practicing technique atop the Pyramid of Argus where we just fought Blades. Sure, we get a little bit of story narration, but god damn, even one painting or drawing would have gone a long way visually. This sucks. They covered the surface of the pyramid awaiting Scorpion's command. Speaking of things that suck, we've got to touch on aerial combat. Saying it flat out sucks might be a bit harsh, but Midway really pushed this feature heading into Armageddon's release as well. The aerial combat system in Armageddon is going to really expand the, the fighting plane. I may have a different experience from other players, and you guys are more than welcome to share your stories in the comments, but aerial combat almost never made a difference when I was playing. I don't even remember it's there most of the time, and when my opponent and I are magnetized together mid-jump, I usually only land one or two shots before I realize I've completely missed my opportunity. I mentioned the Pyramid of Argus a minute ago when talking about the arcade endings, and I know what you're thinking. What the hell is the Pyramid of Argus? That's a fair question, so let's get into it. Armageddon's Conquest mode follows the story of two brand new characters, brothers named Taven and Dagon. They're the sons of the newly introduced Elder Gods, Delia and Argus. The Elder Gods foresaw a day where the realms would overflow with powerful fighters, and they created the warrior Blaze to balance the universe and wipe out those fighters when the time was right. Taven and Dagon were put into a forced slumber, and would be awakened near Armageddon with the goal of slaying Blaze and bringing peace to the realms. This is the extremely shortened and less spoilerific version of the plot, by the way, so just bear with me. The Conquest plot is fairly complicated and can be difficult to keep up with, but luckily the gameplay is great, and you'll have no trouble staying engaged. Unlike Deception's Conquest mode, which featured an open world that spanned across the realms, Armageddon's Conquest is exclusively linear. We're dropped at point A and have to fight our way to point B, level by level. Hidden secrets and chests containing unlockable content are plentiful, but it's the combat that keeps the mode enticing throughout its near 15 hour runtime. Deception only proposed combat by transporting the player into the arcade mode format, whereas Armageddon has simply mapped attacks to the face buttons like a true third person action RPG. Outstanding. Throughout the story we acquire new special attacks like the ground pound and fireball, among others, 
and we can find permanent power-ups that increase our health and magic bars. Conquest mode in Armageddon is awesome and feels much more like a God of War spin-off than it does a Mortal Kombat mode, and that's not a complaint. I started up Conquest mode and played through damn near the entire story before starting to write this script. I had beaten it years ago when the game came out. My plan was to just familiarize myself and get back into the groove of things before I start writing. I didn't want to put it down. I had to force myself to turn the system off. Conquest mode is so good. Now a main staple in the franchise, the crypt returns, and this time around ditches the graveyard look in favor of a mausoleum design. The crypt's contents can be unlocked through discovery and conquest, or through traditional purchase, using the coins you've earned across your time spent in Armageddon's myriad game modes. A great way to spend your hard-earned coins is on gear and accessories in the brand new, highly requested creative fighter mode. For the first time, we've got full control over our own custom character. We can modify their looks, gear, moveset, and choice of weapons. And truth be told, there's a hell of a lot of variety housed in here. A quick YouTube search was all it took to get a load of what sorts of creations MK fans have been able to put together throughout the years, and a good number of them are pretty damn impressive. Side note, Creative Fighter is exclusive to Armageddon, and in 12 years has never once returned to the series. Alright Dan Dans, rev your goddamn engines, because it's time we took a look at the first and only time Mortal Kombat has dipped its foot into the racing genre. Motor Kombat is an obvious play on Mario Kart, featuring our favorite MK fighters and unique vehicles complete with their own special moves. There are 10 characters to choose from and 5 tracks to race on, which is more than enough bang for your buck, especially considering most of the people who bought this game probably didn't even know the mode existed when they made their purchase. I mean, how could they? Nobody in their right mind would assume Mortal Kombat would include a kart racer mode. For example, here's a funny story. As I was doing research for this episode and playing the game, my girlfriend looked up from her book and asked, What game is this? I answered, Mortal Kombat Armageddon. She responded, What? At this point in the history of Mortal Kombat, you all know I am a huge mark for stage fatalities. Not only does Armageddon hold on to damn near every one of Deception's death traps, but it adds a whole new handful of anarchy to the batch, creating the most volatile concoction of environmental hazards we've seen yet. We're definitely meeting and exceeding our spike pick quota. But you can't forget about the crushers and grinders either. You've also got to remember your harmful liquids. And hey, how about a fucking catapult? I mean, why not? My favorite, though, is the portal. I had always wondered what had happened out there, and now we know. That's no bueno, dog. Mortal Kombat Armageddon reviewed very well, but it's a good thing that it served as an ending to the timeline, as players and critics once again began to grow tired of a familiar formula. Deadly Alliance, Deception, and now Armageddon all ran on the same engine, and after five years, that engine began to show its age. Armageddon's Conquest mode tells the story of the end, but it doesn't quite give us a clear look at what the future of Mortal Kombat holds. It would be five years before that main storyline was picked back up, but in between, we took a step into the next generation and took a look at one of the biggest what-ifs in video game history. It was April 2008. I was online, specifically on AOL Instant Messenger, talking to my buddy Giuseppe. He just read a leak that the next Mortal Kombat game was going to be a crossover featuring the heroes of the DC Universe. I responded the way anyone would. I said, there's no way that's true. Why would they make a game like that? It doesn't make any sense. The next day, I went online again, and I watched the brand new debut trailer for the game I said would never happen. The internet wasn't sure what to make of the news. Mortal Kombat characters fighting DC superheroes? Why? The idea seemed totally out of left field to most fans, myself included. But the initial trailer left me with a feeling that wasn't shared by most. 
I couldn't fucking wait for this game. I'd grown up a huge fan of Mortal Kombat, obviously. And while I didn't start reading comics until I was in my early 20s, I was still a huge DC fan, having grown up with Batman the Animated Series, Superman the Animated Series, and Justice League. These two franchises were colliding, and I was ready to take the plunge. Reports are coming in that Darkseid has been defeated by Superman. Ah! Conquest mode had become a staple in the MK series across the PS2 trilogy, but much like the generational leap from PlayStation 2 to PlayStation 3, the storytelling was ready to evolve as well. Conquest was no more, and in its place, we've got a brand new story mode with two unique sides to play in whichever order we prefer. Choose your side. Mortal Kombat diehards will jump into the MK story first, which sees Shao Kahn battling Raiden. Your invasion of Earthrealm violated the rules of Mortal Kombat, Shao Kahn. Khan is exhausted from battle, and in a defeated rage attempts to murder Quan Chi. Raiden intervenes and blasts him with electricity, sending him into an outworld portal. What have you done? In this very same moment, in another universe, Superman dispatches of Darkseid in a battle that has seemingly wreaked havoc on Metropolis. Superman blasts Darkseid with heat vision just as he attempts to escape through an interdimensional boom tube. And, you guessed it. Insolent fool! You're destabilizing the boom tube! Both evil bosses being blasted into world-bending portals at the same time fucked everything up. The realms of the Mortal Kombat universe began to blend with the DC universe, and two worlds colliding is never a good thing. What sorcery is this? Interesting. Sub-Zero! Coward! First you hide behind others, now you hide behind an illusion?! Shao Kahn and Darkseid are fused into one ultimate asshole named Dark Khan which is a terrible fucking name. It's about as original as Poochie from The Simpsons. I bet they came up with the name the same way, too. The rest of you writers start thinking up a name for this funky dog. I don't know, something along the lines of, say, Poochie, only more proactive. Yeah! So, Poochie okay with everybody? Yeah, that's Yeah, I, you know, it's good. Dark Khan, being two ultimate evils mixed into one being, is unstable. His rage courses throughout the fractured worlds, blinding the combatants on both sides, which is the explanation for why nobody tries to just talk this out and instead resort to violence immediately. The cutscenes and voice acting in story mode are... Are you ready for this? Really fucking good, actually, I'm happy to say. There are a few stilted performances here and there, but all in all, MK vs. DC shows a marked improvement over the games of the past. One of the main questions fans had heading into the game was, obviously, what about Superman? Shouldn't he be able to grab any of the Mortal Kombat fighters and tear them in half if he wanted to? And the answer is, well, no. Magic is one of Superman's understated weaknesses, and characters like Shang Tsung have magical abilities up the ass, so... He's weakened. Magic. They also use the rage being put out by Dark Khan as the justification for how Joker can be competitive in a fight with Batman or Sub-Zero or Scorpion. These things tend to happen when you have a Worlds Collide story. There are little liberties that need to be taken in order for everything to make sense, so it kind of comes with the territory. Side note, I completed both story modes in 2008. You receive a bronze trophy for beating each side, and then a gold trophy for completing both sides. Unless you're me. My game glitched, so the trophy for beating both sides never popped. Until, Until now. now. I went back and played both modes all the way through for the sake of researching this series, and my trophy finally popped. It might be 10 years too late, but goddammit, I deserve it. 
Two brand new features come to the game in the shape of free fall combat and close combat. Connecting with a strong attack near certain destructible barriers will send your opponent careening through the wall and into the sky where we move in for the kill. Players can attack and defend in an attempt to reverse their fate, and once the designated damage threshold is reached, tapping R1 performs a super move. Each character has their own distinct super move which deals extra damage and looks cool as hell. Close combat is similar to a grapple move. Tapping R1 in a standing position pulls your opponent into a clinch range, where simpler yet more brutal attacks can be landed. Innovation and evolution are a key ingredient to any series traveling from one generation of consoles to another, and we can definitely see huge steps made on the graphical side of things. Each and every character looks great in action, and there's even a free roam camera in the biography section that allows us to take a close look at the entire roster. Not to be left out in the evolution department is Test Your Might, which returns with a brand new face. Several levels contain breakable walls similar to those used in freefall combat, but seeing as though we're on the ground, nobody's falling. Instead, we're getting a running start and smashing the poor bastard we're fighting through as many walls as possible by button mashing like our life depends on it. I always enjoyed this little feature, even if it gave me flashbacks of the blisters I used to get from Mortal Kombat 1's Test Your Might minigame. I remember signing onto message boards leading up to the game's release, doing my damnedest to find out every little detail about what fighters were going to make the roster. Fans from both sides were clamoring to have their favorites make the cut. All in all, I think Midway did a pretty damn good job. On the Mortal Kombat side of things, we've got Baraka, Jax, Kano, Katana, Liu Kang, Raiden, Scorpion, Shang Tsung, Shao Kahn, Sonya Blade, and Sub-Zero. The DC roster is comprised of Batman, Captain Marvel, or Shazam, Catwoman, Deathstroke, Darkseid, The Flash, Green Lantern, The Joker, Lex Luthor, Superman, and Wonder Woman. Ed Boon stated that certain characters were chosen simply for their recognizability, like Scorpion, Sub-Zero, Batman, and Superman, while others made the cut based on how well they played against someone on the opposite side. Raiden and Captain Marvel both have lightning-based powers, so it's awesome to see them face off. As a fan of both properties, seeing these rivalries take shape is a real treat. What wasn't a treat was being promised DLC that never saw the light of day. Quan Chi and Harley Quinn were both confirmed to be headed to the game post-release, but were scrapped due to financial troubles that we'll touch on later. Mortal Kombat's fatalities have always been the source of major controversy, and MK vs. DC would be no different. The blood, guts, decapitations, impalements, and more were always scrutinized by the media, but it was this violence that played a pivotal role in what made Mortal Kombat so special. Unfortunately, one of the main pieces of the puzzle in getting DC Comics to sign on for the project was a complete and total removal of gruesome on-screen killings. DC execs would not allow for Superman and company to be seen killing other fighters, or to be on the receiving end of a decapitation or dismemberment. This meant that, for the first and only time in history, Mortal Kombat would receive a T14 rating from the ESRB. DC Heroes had finishing moves called Heroic Brutalities, where the developers made a point to show that the opponent was still alive by having them writhe in pain. Batman wins. Heroic brutality. MK fighters and DC villains, on the other hand, were still able to perform deadly finishers. They're just not quite as brutal as the moves we've seen in the past. The limitations in toned down violence, all in all, does suck, because it would have been amazing to see what the guys Midway would have cooked up for normally anti-murder heroes like Batman and Superman, but it never struck me as being the biggest deal. You can feel free to disagree with me in the comments, I'll be happy to reply to you, but to me it's not just the violence that makes Mortal Kombat special. I enjoy the characters and their personal stories and abilities. I enjoy seeing who's going to come back from the dead for revenge, who's going to turn heel and join a new faction. I enjoy the entire world of Mortal Kombat. T14 
Taking away the depravity of it doesn't damage how much I like the franchise, which speaks volumes to me regarding how I actually feel about these games. Side note, there were a couple of fatalities that were actually censored in the American release. <laughs> Apparently Joker and Deathstroke shooting their opponents in the head is just too much for a T rating. Doing a Google search in 2018 will lead you to message boards and Reddit posts full of gamers trashing MK vs DC, stating that it doesn't belong in the same breath as other games in the series, and it was never good to begin with. The game did well with critics, garnering scores between the mid-7 and mid-8 ranges, while selling nearly 2 million copies worldwide. I'm actually quite a big fan of the game, and I've popped it into my PS3 several times over the years to get my fix. I won't tell anyone who doesn't like it that they're wrong, to each their own, but I love it. Mortal Kombat vs DC Universe would be the final game Midway ever released, as their financial woes piled up to the point of bankruptcy. The Mortal Kombat license would quickly be picked up by Warner Brothers, and a facelift to the development team would take shape in the form of NetherRealm Studios. That's gonna do it for the history of Mortal Kombat Part 3, Dan Dance. Thank you for joining me for this End Times and Crossover. Before we take a look at the once again unclear future of Mortal Kombat, I am going to take you back to the past. To play the shitty games that suck ass. Well, yeah, kind of. Next time out, we're going to take a look at the myriad spin-off titles deep in Mortal Kombat's closet. I'll see you next time. At this point in the history of Mortal Kombat, we've traveled from the arcades, to the home consoles, from Earthrealm to the DC Universe, and everywhere in between. It's a journey that has thus far taken us from 1992 to 2008, but for the history of Mortal Kombat Part 4, I'm gonna take you back to the past. To play the shitty games that suck ass. Well, yeah, for the most part. Every successful series has tried their hands at spin-offs somewhere along the way, right? What the hell is a spin-off, anyway? Well, the online definition I found was a byproduct or incidental result of a larger project, which sounds about right to me. Without spin-off titles, we'd never have gotten the GameCube classic Luigi's Mansion. Hell, we wouldn't have Mario Kart if it weren't for taking an established series and iterating on it in a completely new way. But trying your hand at something new can also yield unforeseen results. October 1st, 1997 saw the release of Mortal Kombat Mythologies Sub-Zero. The game is a side-scrolling action-adventure title obviously set in the MK universe, taking place before the events of the first Mortal Kombat game. At a glance, any fan of the series can see why this would be interesting. A prequel focused on one specific character storyline, with answers to so many of the questions we've conjured up throughout the years? Where do I sign up? I signed up at Hollywood Video with my brother because it was 1997 at the time and renting games was still the cool thing to do. I remember both of us sitting down in the glow of our fucked up TV that had been handed down to us that would sometimes turn green for some reason, and we were ready to learn as much as we could about the Lin Kuei warrior we knew so little about. The first thing we thought was, wow, this looks really cool. Scorpion issues a fairly muffled and hard to understand warning before scurrying off like Skeletor. You will fail. <laughs> and then it's off to the races. For the first time ever, we are not bound to just one screen in Mortal Kombat. The controls are exactly like any other MK game you've ever played, and that's the first problem. This isn't just a 2D fighting game. It almost feels like one when you're in combat, but trying to fight any of the enemies is a nightmare, as jumping over your opponent leads to you facing the opposite direction. And we can't just turn and throw a high kick, no, we have to land, press the turn around button, and plan our attack from there. I don't know who thought this was a good idea, but they're a total fuckface. We've got the godfather, the doctor of video games, Eugene Jarvis. Uh, what do you call yourself? Ah, uh, face. <laughs> Through beating enemies, we gain experience points and new abilities, like the Ice Blast and the Slide Kick. The enemies are... Alright, hold on. The enemies are bullshit. They always get the jump on us because we're too close to the edge of the screen. Look at the classics like Castlevania. Our sprite is much smaller and we are dead center. We can react to anything with a fair amount of time. Now look at Mythologies. 
The amount of room that is wasted behind us is larger than the amount of room in front of us, where all of our enemies and environmental hazards lie. This might sound like run-of-the-mill shitty gamer complaining, but I have proof that this is not just me that has trouble here. In the game's making of feature, the lead graphics designer is demonstrating gameplay. Even he gets blindsided by an enemy without having enough time to react. One thing you want to do is be very careful when you're running into rooms because there could be a monk right behind a door. He worked on the game and he's not ready for the enemies. Come on. Early in the game, I'm talking the first level, we come face to face with these crusher gimmicks. Coming anywhere near them will smash you into a million pieces. I gotta go. Fucking motherfucker! <laughs> Back up trick. Oh, mother fucking bad damn it. <laughs> The trick is to trigger them with a high kick and then sprint underneath when the crusher is retracting back into the ceiling. For the sake of getting through this in a timely manner, we'll skip over the frustration of what it's like trying to figure out that that's what you're supposed to do, as well as the frustration of having to juggle fighting multiple enemies with multiple crushers in the same room. Trying to explain stiff and unresponsive controls in a video game is like watching people eat really spicy foods. It just doesn't translate unless you're the one experiencing it firsthand. Ah! Oh, now they're gonna start doing that shit! After beating Scorpion and finishing the first level, we get our initial cutscene, which on the PlayStation version is presented through full motion video with real actors. Some of the acting is pretty good, but some of it is downright terrible, but we've come to expect that from Mortal Kombat. Once again, our most cunning assassin and thief is successful. At ease, Lin Kuei Warrior. Greetings! I see the ninja has been successful in retrieving my map. The thing that stands out to me here is how awesome Quan Chi looks, compared to how lame Sub-Zero looks. Quan Chi's costume is super detailed, his makeup is great. Meanwhile, the star character looks cheaper than the first $30 costume I found on Amazon. That's a great way to sell your game, right? Any non-gamer would look at this and say, Oh, who's that guy in the face paint? I want to play as him. Also, why is Sub-Zero standing like he's in an elevator that's falling down a shaft and he's bracing for impact? Ah, oh, never mind. straight. I am not a ninja. I am Lin Kuei. Scorpion was a ninja. Side note, there's a callback to this cutscene in MK vs. DC Universe. The image of Sub-Zero crawling over the mountain is nearly identical. I didn't notice this until I was working on this documentary, so if it was news to you, it was news to me too. Level 2 has us looking for the wind element, and it's all about platforming. We're jumping from rock to rock, and we need the wind to blow to carry us across certain gaps that are too large for a normal jump. The wind gusts have no discernible pattern, and standing around like an asshole waiting for it to blow can be extremely inconvenient. After a few rounds of this, we reach the spoons. Now obviously they're not real spoons. These are platforms that are connected to these windmills that we have to jump across to get from point A to point B. But I want to know why these windmills spin 360 degrees, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Whoever put the- oh, never mind. Getting from one of these spoons to the next is a pain in the ass because it's nearly impossible to judge when you're supposed to jump. The best strategy I could come up with was not waiting until it's in front of me, but jumping as soon as it broke the edge of the screen and becomes visible. Even then, this only works a good, I'd say, 60% of the time. You know what's odd? Mortal Kombat Mythology's Sub-Zero wasn't the first game to mix 2D side-scrolling action with platforming and Mortal Kombat controls. That honor goes to Batman Forever, for some reason. I don't really know how Midway could have been beaten to the punch on their own idea, and I also can't figure out how they could have played this pile of shit and thought, yeah, that's what we should do. But here we are. The worst part of it all is that I rented both of these games, Batman Forever and MK Mythologies, over and over as a kid. I never really enjoyed them, I was consistently frustrated by them, but I wanted to see more. I wanted to know what was going to happen at the end of the story. Unfortunately for me, Mythologies is extremely difficult, even as an adult, and I do not have the patience nor any interest in trying to complete it. I've always thought it was pretty common knowledge that Mythologies was dog shit, but looking back at the review scores, you'd never know it. I don't know what the fuck Jeff Gersman from GameSpot was thinking giving it a 7.5 out of 10. IGN's 3 is way, way closer to what was widely felt today, and is a score I can agree with. 
I'm a huge Mortal Kombat fan, and I would never celebrate a failure for a franchise I love, so it does suck that it turned out this way. Sub-Zero was the first character to receive the Mythologies treatment, but he'd also be the last, as the plan to turn Mythologies into its own series was cancelled shortly after the game's release. Even with the cancellation of Mythologies, the completely unnecessary world of Mortal Kombat spin-offs was just getting started. Could the team at Midway take what they learned from Mythologies and put it together into something that would make the next game better? Or are we destined to play yet another horrible Mortal Kombat spin-off? In just three years time, we'd have our answer. Mortal Kombat Special Forces was the next attempt at broadening the Mortal Kombat horizons. A third-person action-adventure game starring Major Jackson Briggs hunting down members of the Black Dragon one by one? Machine guns, sniper rifles, explosives, brand new characters... This sounds excellent, right? After the badly botched attempt that was MK Mythologies, you've got to think the team in Midway would really buckle down and get this one right. And then you pop the disc in and check out the opening cinematic. What the fuck is this? Disco music? The special effects and backgrounds look like something out of a junior high practice project in a low level art class, and I can't shake a weird black exploitation vibe. He's the baddest dude with the biggest gun. He's savage. Let me be completely transparent and honest up front. The first time I've played Special Forces was for this documentary. Every other Mortal Kombat game in history I eagerly awaited. I snatched it up as soon as I could, and I spent as much time with it as possible. Something about this game never called to me as a kid. I was 10 when it came out, and over the years I came to know it as a complete pile of shit, so I steered clear. Is it really the piece of shit I've known it to be over the years? Let's find out. Well, oh man, the controls are extremely stiff. And by that I mean sometimes when you press the D-pad to turn Jax through the environment, he just doesn't move. If you're near a wall or a door, he's staying put. This gets old really, really quickly. When it comes to the combat, they've dropped the classic Mortal Kombat control scheme. What they've replaced it with is somehow worse. At least Mythologies had the normal MK cat and mouse game of sweep kicks, uppercuts, high and low punches. You can win any of the Special Forces hand-to-hand -hand fights by simply pressing the X button until your opponent falls down. Increasingly intricate combos can be unlocked by running through enemies and gaining experience points, but it doesn't do much in the way of improving the gameplay. Each and every fight is a joyless rock'em sock'em button masher without an ounce of strategy in sight. The camera is something else. What is this angle? We go from oddly oriented overhead shots to standard behind the character third person angles, and holding L1 switches us to a first person view. I'm not sure what this view is for. Scanning around the room takes forever, and the draw distance leaves much to be desired, so we can't see exceptionally far. I really feel like the first person option is here just to give the player a way out of having to walk down long hallways, which goes to show you how confident the developers were in the level design. The first level is a boring whirlwind of fist fights, key cards, locked doors, and elevator rides. At the end of each level we get a boss fight, and our first boss is No Face. No Face's only Mortal Kombat appearance is this one right here. He's got no ears, no nose, no nothing outside of a flamethrower and grenades. How do we get past a tough customer like this? Well, easy. Let him throw his bombs and shoot his fire, sneak up, and literally press X a thousand times. He's not smart enough to try and put distance between the two of us and throw more bombs, so he'll just keep swinging and allowing us to beat him to the punch. My advice? Don't try and throw any fancy combos or he might slip in a punch of his own. The safe bet is X all the way. Several other characters make their debuts here as well. Gemini is Jax's teammate. She dishes out mission information before we head into battle. Also, we never even see her in the game and this is the only time she's ever been mentioned. So that's that on Gemini. Tasia is a ninja who comes complete with dual swords and the ability to teleport. She's a boss fight, and after that, you'll never see her again. Tremor is the star of the show here. 
He's got the classic MK Ninja look, which automatically makes him interesting to the fan base. We are all, we are guilty, all guilty, of guilty of this. And his special moves come in the shape of geokinesis, or the ability to move and meld the earth to his liking. Tremor was the only debuting character to not be a one and done, as he would, after many years of requests, finally return as a downloadable fighter in 2015's Mortal Kombat X. Dan Dance, I could endlessly reiterate how boring this game is, but going beat for beat, detail by detail, level by level, telling you how much it sucks would be just as boring as playing the game itself. The game sucks, you know it sucks, but what's most interesting is even Midway seemed to know it sucked. Several key players, including Mortal Kombat co-creator John Tobias, left Midway while the game was still in development. The team was fractured, production was all kinds of fucked up, and things were quickly going off the rails. The N64 and Dreamcast versions of Special Forces were quickly cancelled. Sonya Blade was supposed to be a second playable character, though that was obviously removed. Ed Boon has publicly disowned the game, openly stating, I did not work on Special Forces. The game and project were riddled with all kinds of problems. I could write a book on that. The game is widely regarded as the worst of the Mortal Kombat games and is commonly listed as one of the worst games of all time. Number 5, Mortal Kombat Special Forces. The most unfortunate part of Special Forces being another complete commercial and critical failure is that once again all future Mortal Kombat side projects were put on hold. Solo games starring Baraka and Liu Kang were in very early discussions and only one of those games would end up seeing the light of day. Released on the PlayStation 2 and original Xbox in September of 2005, Mortal Kombat Shaolin Monks was the third and final MK spin-off. The game retells the events that take place between Mortal Kombat and Mortal Kombat 2, opening with a beautiful cinematic that shows the final moments of the original tournament. All hell has clearly broken loose as Sonya Blade battles Kano, Reptile snacks on Johnny Cage's head, Scorpion and Sub-Zero's rivalry continues to boil over. And Kung Lao shows up with one of the coolest entrances of all time. Now Dan as I am well aware that we are 0-2 on Mortal Kombat spinoffs so far. But fear not, I have excellent news. Mortal Kombat Shaolin Monks is a fucking excellent game. For the first time in any of these side projects or spin-offs, whatever you want to call them, Ed Boon is on as the creative director, and it definitely makes a difference. We don't have to worry about adjusting new ideas to the classic MK control scheme like Mythology's tried and failed to do. We don't have to fight the camera in an attempt to simply see where we're going like was necessary in Special Forces. Shaolin Monks debuts a brand new gameplay device called the Multi-Directional Fighting Engine, which, in short, means that we can comfortably battle swarms of enemies all at the same time. Square, Triangle, and Circle all contain different attack types which can be modified by holding the R1 button. Experience points gained by killing enemies and defeating bosses can be spent to upgrade our existing attacks or unlock new ones. Fatalities are triggered by filling a meter and tapping L1, and dozens of varied finishing moves can be unlocked over the course of the game. Multalities are brand new and serve to kill as many on-screen foes as possible. Brutalities make their return here granting us unlimited one-hit kill projectile attacks for a set amount of time. The sheer amount of flexibility in the gameplay department isn't restricted to just combat, though. Over time, we learn new ways to traverse the environment, like the ability to jump across further distances, to climb on walls, and to swing from one pole to the next. Each one of these traversal tricks opens up brand new areas on the map, which were previously inaccessible, encouraging the player to revisit seemingly completed levels. I want to take an extra second to talk about the multiplayer function here. The entire story of Shaolin Monks can be played cooperatively, meaning that you and a friend can sit down together and run through the full story as a team. And even better than that, after you've completed the game, Scorpion and Sub-Zero are unlocked, so you can play through again as a completely different character or team. 
Sure, they still have Liu Kang and Kung Lao's voices and mannerisms during the cutscenes, but who cares? By the time you've unlocked the ninjas, you've played through the whole story anyway, so this is all previously charted territory. The events of Shaolin Monks taking place between Mortal Kombat and Mortal Kombat 2 means that we get to revisit stages we first laid eyes on back in 1993, but this time with way more freedom. The Living Forest was always a spooky place, but being untethered from the confines of 2D gameplay means we get to explore the entire landscape on our own. There were always rumors of a secret stage fatality in MK2 involving one of the Living Forest trees eating your opponent. In traditional Mortal Kombat fashion, Shaolin Monk saw the 12-year-old rumor come to life. That is awesome. Other callbacks include encountering Reptile atop the pit while an obstruction passes by the moon, finally finding out who the glowing eyes belong to down in Goro's lair, and many, many more. I wouldn't dare spoil all these little surprises, as they're one of the best parts of the game. It's not all exploration though. Each level ends with an insane boss fight. And being that Shaolin Monks is non-canonical to the ongoing story, all bets are off. The creative team didn't have to worry about who to keep around so they could appear in Mortal Kombat 3 or Mortal Kombat 4. Each fight can end with a horrific fatality, as any Mortal Kombat battle should. Reptile's boss fight comes at the end of the Living Forest level and has us first dispatching of the guard to his lair, a lightning fast, nearly 200 foot long snake. We obviously can't go toe to toe with this beast and instead have to take the entire building down to defeat him. Unlike his quickly crushed guard, Reptile's death is measured and brutal. At the end of the game, we're faced with a trio of boss fights in Khan's arena. First up is the newly youthful Shang Tsung, who morphs into different combatants as the fight goes on. When it's all said and done, our fatality features a sequence straight out of the first MK movie and a satisfying snap of the sorcerer's neck. Up next is Kintaro, and holy shit does this game do him justice. He's enormous, destructively powerful, and he's not to be taken lightly. After a long and hard battle, Kintaro's death may be the most brutal of them all. Shao Kahn is the main event, and goodness fucking gracious is this fight hard. It is of utmost importance to not make a single mistake, as Khan will take advantage of each and every one of them. It takes the combined strength of Raiden, Kung Lao, and Liu Kang to put the Emperor of Outworld away for good. Side note, Scorpion has no patience for our bullshit in Shaolin Monks. Yes, that's real. I don't know if any games were talked about in the recess playground as much as Mortal Kombat was when I was growing up. Everyone was talking about secret fatalities, secret levels, secret characters, secret everything. Shaolin Monks takes the Mortal Kombat secret days of old and runs with it. Unlocking the Fist of Ruin ability allows us to break giant statues that block secret paths. One such path leads to the Warrior Shrine, the statue-filled battleground as seen in Mortal Kombat 1. Interacting with each statue reads the name of the fighter. We've got Sonya, Goro, Liu Kang, but who is that? Interacting with the Mystery Man statue three times causes it to explode, releasing Ermac, which triggers a hidden boss fight. This, of course, is a callback to the MK1 rumor Electronic Gaming Monthly published more than a decade prior. In 1993, a reader by the name of Tony Casey claimed to have encountered a red ninja in Ermac, but was unable to make him appear again, noting, I think it has something to do with the warrior shrine. 
Midway, you tricky bastards. Another excellent reference to the past can be seen by accessing a secret area in the Living Forest. The mysterious Grey Ninja, Smoke, was first seen in 1993, peeking from behind the trees, so to find him hiding here once again is no shocker. Only this time, he issues us five specific missions of increasing difficulty. And what's our prize at the end of the day? How about a fully playable version of Mortal Kombat 2? Flawless victory. Fatality. That is badass. The greatest secret hidden inside of Mortal Kombat Shaolin Monks is the survival mode. It's rumored that survival was supposed to be a highlighted feature in the main menu, but it was cut due to time constraints. It took fans over a year to find out the survival was hidden somewhere in the game, and when you find out how they found it, you're gonna shit your pants. Survival mode can be accessed only through the Foundry level. There are 11 steps that need to be followed thoroughly, and I'm gonna speed through them for the sake of your time. The video I'm using to show you this can be seen on YouTube. First we jump in and out of the lava. Next we go through several key entrances and grab a giant axe. Head down the tunnel to the save statue and smash the barrel. Head into the center of the level, turn left and smash the barrel closest to you. Head around to the smaller room, smash another barrel. Make your way to the rock crusher and smash the barrel next to the and then smash the ground. A green portal appears and interacting with it transports you to survival mode. Who the fuck figured this out? Back in the day, we would freak out if we pulled off a fatality, and that was like three or four buttons mixed together. But to be in a certain room and smash a certain barrel in a certain order with a certain character and a certain weapon and jump in and out of lava, it's insanity. I don't know how it was done, but someone figured it out. Anyway, let's change the subject. It's interesting to note that Shaolin Monks wasn't originally going to follow the Shaolin Monks at all. It was meant to be a single player game following Raiden, but this idea was scrapped. What's funny is that while the initial idea was all about Raiden, the Thunder God himself isn't playable in Shaolin Monks at all, either in story mode or versus mode. Oh yeah, there's a versus mode! Not only can you team up with a friend and fight through the main story, but you can challenge each other head to head in combat as well. Versus mode features several fighters other than the Shaolin Monks themselves, including Sub-Zero, Scorpion, Johnny Cage, Baraka, Katana, and Reptile, who can be unlocked through discovery and story mode. Versus is frantic, fast-paced, and a lot of fun. And I applaud Midway for including the classic one-on-one -on -one combat style powered by a completely new engine. Mortal Kombat Shaolin Monks released two excellent reviews and went on to sell over a million copies worldwide. The game was proof that given the right creative team and the proper amount of time, a Mortal Kombat spin-off title could be great. I don't know how popular or unpopular this opinion is with diehard fans, and I'd love to hear your input in the comments and we'll talk about it, but Shaolin Monks is up there for my favorite Mortal Kombat game of all time. The gameplay is addictive, the level design is exceptional, and the sheer freedom we have to explore the world of Mortal Kombat 2 is unrivaled. No MK spin-off story comes without tragedy though. A sequel to Shaolin Monks called Mortal Kombat Fire and Ice was intended to be the next entry in the new series, but was cancelled when Midway Studios LA closed its doors due to financial issues. Ed Boon stated in 2013 he'd love to develop a true sequel somewhere down the line, and even said that an HD up-res version for the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 was being discussed internally, but that was five years ago now, and we have had no further update. That's going to do it for the History of Mortal Kombat Part 4, Dan Nans, the brutality of spin-offs. Thank you very much for joining me. Next month, we're going to come back one last time to check out the past, present, and future of the series, so make sure you don't miss Part 5. But before that, if you want some more content, you can go to iTunes or SoundCloud and listen to a very special episode of the 616 Entertainment Podcast, where I sit down with a couple of friends and we check out the Mortal Kombat movies. It's been highly requested as the series is going on for me to do the movies, and I thought instead of dissecting it and doing a scripted video like this, I'd sit down with a couple of friends, talk it out, review them, talk about how bad Annihilation is, whatever you want. You can listen to it right now. I love you. Thank you very much. And I'll see you next time.
2006's Mortal Kombat Armageddon was meant to be the end of the original Mortal Kombat timeline, but finishing the game's conquest mode left fans with more questions than answers, as it seemed to leave several possibilities for future plans up in the air. The quest did nothing to resolve the instability of the realms. Was Midway really going to kill off all of our beloved MK fighters and wipe the slate clean? I mean, yeah, that's exactly what they did. After a crossover with the DC Universe and five years of waiting for the canonical story to be picked back up, the newly titled NetherRealm Studios hit the ground running. Mortal Kombat 9 functions as a reboot to the series and fittingly takes on a simple title of Mortal Kombat. When I say things like reboot and wipe the slate clean, I don't mean that 19 years of history and storytelling are being blinked out of existence. All of those things still happened. Everything that led us up to Armageddon all goes down in the history books, as the opening of MK9 shows us. The opening cinematic picks up at the very end of the Battle of Armageddon. Beloved MK fighters aren't just hurt or beaten, they're ripped to shreds, decapitated, deader than anyone has ever been. Atop the Pyramid of Argus, Shao Kahn not only defeated Blaze, but is on his way to finishing Raiden and claiming the entire world as his own. Knowing that this is the end of all things, Raiden gets tricky. He uses his electrical powers on his crushed amulet and somehow pulls off the impossible by sending a message back in time to himself. He must win. It doesn't take long to figure out where in time Raiden sent the message. The start of the original Mortal Kombat tournament. The gang's all here. Johnny Cage, Liu Kang, Sonya Blade. The game's story is a complete retelling of Mortal Kombat 1, 2, and 3, only this time we're informed by the future. The rushes of nostalgia I felt playing through story mode on launch day are unmatchable by anything else I've ever played. I actually sat down and played all the way through story mode in one sitting. I was absolutely glued to the screen. Any longtime fan of the series knows, this was made for us. As far as nostalgia and awesome callbacks are concerned, it's one thing to relive Johnny Cage and Sonya Blade meeting for the first time. Look, baby, I can't let you run loose without an escort. I don't need an escort, and I'm sure as hell not your baby. It's another thing to relive Smoke peeking from behind the trees in the living forest, only this time we see it from his point of view. But then there are those special MK moments that only the guys and girls at Netherrealm can bring us. Case in point this time around is Scarlet. Who the hell is Scarlet? Well, people asked themselves that question for years. Back in 1993, a rumor went around that accompanying the blue, green, and pink female ninjas Katana, Jade, and Melina was a red female ninja named Scarlet. For nearly 20 years, Scarlet was nothing but a rumor, a story spread across lunchrooms and recessed blacktops and internet message boards. It wasn't until MK9 that she ever really existed, as she can be seen in the background of several cutscenes in story mode. When I first spotted her, I shouted, out loud, Is that fucking Scarlet? Keep in mind, it was 1am and I was alone. I'll never forget that. Raiden is plagued by visions of the future throughout MK9's story mode, and he tries to use the information he gathers through the visions to help secure a future that doesn't end in Armageddon. This leads to him making what he believes are carefully informed decisions, and he, for lack of a better term, fucks it up for everybody. Changing the course of time leads to several major differences in story between the original and the reboot, such as Smoke being rescued during his attempted capture at the hands of the Lin Kuei. In his place, they take his longtime partner and best friend, Sub-Zero. Turning one of the biggest and most recognizable faces in the entire franchise into a cyborg isn't just something completely new and different, but it's a stark reminder to the players that things are not going to be the same this time around. In the original timeline, it's not quite clear what led to Jax wearing metallic plating over his arms. It could have been some new tech he was working on with the special forces that granted him extra strength. His arms could be covered in protective gear, or they may be surgically upgraded. Who knows? It was never properly fleshed out. Jax wins. Flawless victory. In MK9, it's pretty clear why his arms are made of metal. This scene left my jaw on the floor back in 2011, and I find it horrifying to this day. Yeah! 
I won't spoil the nitty gritty of every story beat because A, it would take forever, and B, I'd hate to rob you of the surprises. But what I will say is that, yeah man, things are different this time around. Netherrealm didn't reboot the series as a way to bring characters back to life that they regretted killing, no way. Several big, big name warriors are murdered as the story unfolds. Earthrealm is free! Some of the deaths are shocking and completely out of left field, whereas others are extremely emotional and make you wish things somehow could have been different. I mean, Raiden accidentally burns Liu Kang alive and kills him for fuck's sake. It's really brutal to watch. MK9 has balls, man, and they're not afraid to go places you never expected. Mortal Kombat 9's story mode is impactful and hardcore, and you won't walk away from it feeling disappointed. But we can't talk about story mode the whole time. We've got a whole game to cover here. A major shift on the gameplay front is the return of two dimensions. Players no longer have to be concerned with using the left stick to move around the 3D plane and avoid death traps, as each and every level in MK9 is one straight line. This might sound limiting, but it's really not. The return to 2D actually makes for much more detailed stages with much, much busier backgrounds that you don't want to miss. Not only that, but the pit was made for two dimensions. Fuck that square platform version from Mortal Kombat Deception. MK9 brings back the classic pit and goodness me is it scarier than ever. Scorpion wins. Fatality. Ed Boon stated that before Mortal Kombat vs. DC Universe was set in stone, the plan was to do a gritty, dark reboot of the series. Obviously, MK9 is exactly what he was talking about, but what the hell did he mean by dark? Mortal Kombat has always been dark. Oh, that's what he meant. X-ray moves are a brand new feature introduced in MK9, and yeah, I guess dark and gritty are pretty fitting descriptors. We've always had nasty grapple moves throughout the franchise, but these take it to an entirely different level. X-ray moves also beg the question of what the fuck does it take to kill these guys? What is the difference between a fatality and a grapple move at this point? If you're squeamish, Look away now. The tagline for Mortal Kombat 9 was Fatality Lives. This was Netherrealm's way of letting the player know right off the bat, the T-rated days of MK vs DC are long gone. MK9 steps up with by far the most creative and brutal finishing move seen yet. Honestly Dan Dan, some of these are fucking disgusting. Kung Lao wins flawless victory. Noob Saibot's make a wish fatality is extra, extra gruesome. Noob Saibot wins flawless victory. Stage fatalities are back and better than ever as well. Classics like the subway. and the Deadpool have never looked better. While new stages shine with debuting stage fatalities of their own. Hi, I'm Liu Kang. Welcome to Jackass. Side note, how the fuck have I gotten to the fifth and final installment of this documentary without covering the legend of Toasty? I made a joke about it in part one of this series, and I totally forgot to circle back and explain it. To enter the portal, you have to land an uppercut on your opponent. And if some weird fucker pops out of the corner of the screen and shouts, you gotta hurry up! The toasty guy is Dan Forden, longtime video game audio engineer. Throughout the years, he has shouted several different words at the player during a fight. Crispy. Crispy! Fatality! 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 
and it's about time we show him some love and respect. Long live Dan Forden. Being that MK9 is a retelling of Mortal Kombat 1, 2, and 3, it was to be expected that the roster is comprised of classic fighters we already know and love. What wasn't expected was the level of shine given to characters like Cabal and Stryker, who, for the first time, are genuinely awesome and easy to root for. On top of the already impressive 27 character roster, the complete edition of the game added 4 new fighters to the mix. Joining the fray on the updated version would be the aforementioned Scarlet, the PS2 era favorite Kenshi, Rain, the Prince of Edenia, and Freddy Krueger. What? Yes, you heard me right. The star villain of the Nightmare on Elm Street series, the bastard child of a thousand maniacs, the Springwood slasher, the man himself, Freddy Krueger, is a playable character in Mortal Kombat 9. That is awesome. Oh, and interestingly enough, PlayStation 3 gamers were treated to an exclusive character of their own in Kratos, the star character of the God of War series. His moveset is pulled straight from his very own games, and he fits in perfectly with the highly violent world of fighters that is Mortal Kombat. Kratos even comes complete with his own level and stage fatality too. An interactive stage fatality, no less, the first of its kind. Punch in the right buttons on the Chamber of the Flame stage to see for yourself. While Xbox 360 gamers didn't get an exclusive fighter the way PS3 gamers did, it was to no fault of Netherrealm. Ed Boon told Eurogamer in 2011 that not only did Netherrealm want an exclusive Xbox fighter, but that he specifically wanted Marcus Phoenix from Gears of War or Master Chief from Halo. Boon stated that he's not even really allowed to talk about it, but it seems pretty clear that Microsoft just wasn't interested in letting their homegrown stars get torn apart in the Mortal Kombat universe. What a bunch of babies. MK9's online gameplay featured a mode called King of the Hill, where on top of having to go one-on-one -on -one with another player from somewhere around the world, spectators were allowed to rate the performance of the winners before being called on to participate in the next fight. Man, what a shark tank that is. I'm not bad at Mortal Kombat, I'm actually just alright. I can easily beat all of my friends and I went 5-0 against strangers at the midnight release of the game back in 2011. But playing online? That's another story. I think I only played 7 matches in my entire run where I compiled an extremely underwhelming record of 1-6. Some of these guys didn't even allow me to land a single hit before they took me to the fucking cleaners. It was extremely humbling and also quite discouraging. Tag Team Combat returns in MK9 and features some very cool animations and team-up moves where you switch your player. Test Your Might and Test Your Sight return, and they're joined by the brand new Test Your Strike minigame, which is, for all intents and purposes, a more pinpoint take on the classic Test Your Might formula. <laughs> Challenge Towers are brand new to the series and are sure to keep your hands full, as there are 300 of them all with their own distinct goals and winning conditions. With an excellent roster, the best fatalities in the series up to this point, an amazing story mode, side challenges, and a full crypt of unlockables to keep the player busy. What else could you ask for? Secret fights? Done deal. There are callbacks in exhibition mode that allow us to battle the classic versions of Smoke, Jade, and all the others on their old school home stages in their old school costumes. Mortal Kombat 9 combines everything that was ever great about the series and ditches all of the fluff to deliver is, what in my mind, the best Mortal Kombat game ever made. Fans and critics raved about the reboot, which translated to great review scores and even better sales at retail. After being freed from the shackles of 20 years worth of unclear storytelling, Mortal Kombat was ready to take its first steps on an unbeaten path of a brand new console generation. April 14, 2015 marked the release of Mortal Kombat X on the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. Ready? As always. Mortal Kombat X is far more than just a pretty trailer though, I'll tell you that. 
MKX's story picks up two years after the events of 2011's Mortal Kombat reboot, with the newly revitalized fallen elder god Shinnok attacking Earthrealm with the aid of his undead Revenant army. Smoke, Jax, Nightwolf, Cabal, and many other corrupted warriors fight at Shinnok's side, and before long, the fallen elder god has quickly decimated everyone Earthrealm has to offer including two gods in Raiden and Fujin. And all of Earthrealm will learn the truth of death. Just before Shinnok can take Sonya Blade as his own, a powerful force awakens inside Johnny Cage, granting him superhuman abilities. Johnny Cage takes on Shinnok in one-on-one -on -one combat and miraculously defeats him. With Shinnok once again imprisoned inside his amulet, Earthrealm is saved. War is not over. Quan Chi has escaped. Why are you smiling? She called me Johnny. This is where Mortal Kombat X really gets interesting. We jump ahead 20 years and see Johnny Cage telling a brand new generation of fighters the story of the day he saved the world. This new breed is comprised of Cassie Cage, Johnny's daughter with Sonya Blade. Takeda Takahashi, the son of the blind samurai Kenshi, Kung Jin, the younger cousin of Kung Lao, and Jackie Briggs, the daughter of Jax. Our tried and true favorites like the aforementioned Johnny Cage, Kenshi, and Sonya Blade all show signs of aging, and as we watch these characters interact with each other and learn that Johnny Cage and Sonya went through an awful divorce, there was a time when you cared more about your family than your job and that Kenshi and his son have a distant and strained relationship. You abandoned me. I did not abandon you. I was eight. My mother had just died. It becomes clear that we as the player are not the only thing that has matured over these past 20 plus years. Mortal Kombat itself has grown up. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that Mortal Kombat is wearing a cheap suit to the office and working a boring 9 to 5 job. I'm just saying a series that started as nothing but senseless violence and blood and guts and silliness has evolved into something really, really special over the years. The storytelling and character development in Mortal Kombat X is the high point of the series without question. From the first game until Armageddon, Johnny Cage was just the dick-headed Hollywood actor, just a piece of the puzzle in Earthrealm's stable of warriors. But in this second timeline, established in MK9, Johnny Cage is the man. He's one of the few fighters to walk away from the wars with Shao Kahn with his life. And in Mortal Kombat X, he stops Shinnok's first attempt to overthrow Earthrealm single-handedly. His motivations have nothing to do with fame or with being a champion. Johnny's ego was left behind with the old timeline, and in its place is a burning desire to not only reunite his family, but make his daughter proud and prepare her for the dangers that lie ahead. You should have seen Cass. Wipe the floor with Shinnok. Kung Jin, the younger cousin of the now possessed revenant soldier Kung Lao, is another prime example of MKX shining in the storytelling department. If Kung Jin debuted in 1995 in Mortal Kombat 3, all we know is that he has cool weapons and is shrouded in mystery or something like that. But again, the series has grown up. Story mode shows us that Kung Jin was once a lowlife thief, mad at the world, blaming Raiden for the death of Kung Lao. It's only after an encounter with the Thunder God himself that Kung Jin opens up and reveals that he doesn't believe that his ancestors in the White Lotus Society would welcome him into the fold due to the fact that he's gay. Raiden assures him that this is incorrect. They won't accept. They care only about what is in your heart, not whom your heart desires. The steps taken to improve the cohesion of storytelling in MKX should not be glossed over. This is fantastic stuff. But let's get back into the story itself. We don't have all day. We're already balls deep in the fifth and final part of this documentary. I'm going to try to go as quick as I can when I point out six awesome key factors and plot points. Number one, the story of MKX doesn't just feel like Earthrealm vs. Outworld. We've got faction wars happening left and right. The Special Forces New Blood are going at it with the Outworld Emperor Kotal Kahn. Kotal Kahn's warriors are looking to put a violent end to a civil war with Melina's forces over who is the rightful heir to Shao Kahn's former Outworld throne. 
Scorpion's Shirai Ryu clan break down the doors to the Special Forces quarantine zone to claim the life of Quan Chi. So on and so forth. There's a lot of fucking fighting going on here, and it's a fresh look at what combat can be in the series. Number 2, several undead fighters from Mortal Kombat 9 are saved when Raiden destroys Quan Chi's magical bullshit. Scorpion, Jax, and the now magically no longer Cyborg, Sub-Zero, are all released from the Revenant curse. Unfortunately, Liu Kang, Kung Lao, Katana, and many others are not so lucky. Number 3, Sub-Zero plays back the data from Sector's gear and proves to Scorpion that it was Quan Chi who was behind the deaths of Scorpion's clan and family. For the first time in series history, we see the human sides of these warriors talking it out. The men, not the fighters, Kwai Liang and Hanzo Hisashi sit down to apologize to each other and forgive each other for past transgressions, bringing true finality to a decades-long feud. Also, Frost almost fucked it all up and ruined the whole thing, but thank God Sub-Zero kept it under control. What is this? I did not bring you here for treachery. Frost is strong, but lacks judgment. She cannot see the wisdom of peace. She sucks. Number four, there are some huge deaths in this game. I'm not talking about side characters biting the dust. MKX gives us the canonical deaths of Baraka, Melina, Quan Chi and Shinnok, drastically changing the landscape going forward. Number 5, for the first time in Mortal Kombat, we've got quick time events inside of story mode cutscenes. These pop up fairly often, and I enjoyed every single one of them. MKX does not allow you to stop paying attention to fuck around with your phone while you're playing. If you look away for a second, you gonna get got. And last but not least, what a fucking ending, man. The story comes full circle in the absolute best way possible, with major payoffs not only in Cassie Cage awakening the same superhuman abilities her father did at the start of the story, you son of a bitch! Holy shit, it does run in the family. But in Sonya and Johnny Cage rekindling their past love in the harshest of times, proving that love truly does conquer all, even in the face of ultimate evil. You did a great job with your team, Johnny. You hear that, Cass? She called me Johnny. I thought she might. But that's not all. Mortal Kombat X features an insane post credit scene. It's revealed that in his attempt to repair the Jinsei after the Shinnok War, Raiden's soul was corrupted. He appears before the new rulers of the Netherrealm and warns them that he will no longer stand by in defense of his fighters, and will instead destroy any and all who even think about launching an attack on Earthrealm. To prove he's serious, he leaves behind the severed head of Shinnok. Jesus Christ. There are fates worse than death. The reveal of Liu Kang and Katana as the new king and queen of the Netherrealm gave me fucking goosebumps. Also, does anybody realize that all we've spoken about so far is the story mode? Mortal Kombat X has a plethora of strengths and myriad tricks up its sleeve. Let's take a moment to look at what else the game has to offer, because there's a hell of a lot here. Let's talk about the new additions to the roster. I touched earlier on the Special Forces new blood of Cassie, Jackie, Takeda, and Kung Jin, but they're not the only new faces debuting here. We've got Devora, the Kitian fighter who controls swarms of insects and has large, stinger-tipped arms which protrude from her back. She's the first of her kind in the MK universe, which introduces a brand new realm into our long-running world of lore. Devora serves as the second-in-command to the also-debuting newest Emperor of Outworld, 
Kotal Khan. Khan is an Ashtek warrior who can use the power of the sun to both damage his opponents as well as heal himself. He's bad fucking ass. But real quick though, what's with that name? Kotal Khan? With all the daughters and sons and descendants in this game, many thought Kotal Khan was related to Shao Khan somehow, me included. But he's not. I don't know what the point of that name was at all. Why not name him Kotal King? Kotal Carnage? Anything other than the one name that would confuse players. Apparently that was too much to ask. But anyway, we've also got Aaron Black, the very western looking gunslinging mercenary, and Ferator, the parasitic combination of a hulking brute and smaller mouthpiece warrior riding atop. Not much is known about Ferator at all, with even their official biography in the game giving several possibilities as to who and what they really are. In short, the debuting characters in Mortal Kombat X are all awesome. Unique movesets, unique appearances, shady and scary background stories. These guys and girls are all home runs in my book, a huge improvement over the Deadly Alliance and Deception era of newcomers. It is just about that time, Dan Dans. We gotta talk about fatalities. Believe me when I tell you, these are by far, by far, the most brutal and disgusting finishing moves in Mortal Kombat history. And yes, I know I said that last time, but the bar has been reset. The highly polished, realistic graphics make each and every death hard to watch, and there are several finishers that might legitimately make you want to shield your eyes from the awfulness. One cheat wins. Fatality. Brutalities make their return here as well although this time in a completely different form. Each fighter has a gigantic handful of brutalities at their disposal, which this time bypass the finish him screen entirely. Performing a brutality in MKX requires a modified version of the signature mood to be performed as the final hit of the fight, and the finisher will trigger automatically. Also, did someone mention stage fatalities? Cassie. Fatality. Several characters appear in story mode without being playable in the game. There are cameos by Serena, Smoke, Cabal, Striker, Nightwolf, and others, but we actually go to battle with the likes of Rain and Baraka in the game. Some might find this frustrating, that obviously these characters have assets inside the game that make them functional, but aren't playable in any way. But I don't mind it. To me, it feels very old-school Mortal Kombat. A strong cloak of mystery hangs over these characters. Why include them but not make them playable? I guess we'll never know. I've been talking about everything I love in Mortal Kombat X, but there are areas where the game doesn't shine quite as bright, at least for me. This is all personal opinion, and if you disagree, that's fine. I would love to talk it out with you in the comments below. First off, a huge change was made to the gameplay. Each character now has three different variations to choose from before each fight. For example, if you choose the Cryomancer variation of Sub-Zero, you gain the ability to create ice weapons. The Unbreakable variation focuses on defensive abilities, like the Barrier of Frost. Finally, the Grand Master variation allows the player to create an ice clone, which can be used defensively or thrown as an offensive weapon. I personally find these variations to be extremely intimidating, and I miss the days of simply tapping L1 to switch styles and having all of my moves available at any given time. Tying certain abilities to certain variations makes it much harder to find your footing and your favorite character, which pretty much kept me from ever falling in love with MKX as much as I did with MK9. I won't call online a negative, but I will mention that I barely used it at all, and it feels like a huge part of Mortal Kombat X. Right off the bat, before you can do anything, the game has you choose a faction. Apparently there are constant faction wars being waged online, and every once in a while, even in offline combat, the game will tell you that your faction either won or lost. I don't really know what this means, as I'm not an online gamer and I never really sunk my teeth into MKX online, but it can feel intrusive when I'm just playing through an arcade ladder and this pops up on the screen. Last but not least on the me complaining front, I have to point out that the characters' faces almost all look a bit off. 
Everyone has these highly detailed outfits and bodies, blurring the lines between real life and video game, and then their faces ruin the whole illusion. Oddly enough, UFC fighter Felice Herrig believes that Netherrealm stole her likeness for Cassie and Sony's design. To be honest, I can totally see it. It does look like her, it's just... it's just a little off. I don't know what it is, but they all look really weird. You know who doesn't look weird? The fucking alien. What? Yeah, dude, the xenomorph itself from Alien, just one of many, many downloadable characters released post-launch. Accompanying Alien would be MK staples like Tanya, Tremor, Goro, Boraicho, and the Triborg, which smashes Cyrax, Sector, and Smoke into one fighter, as well as guest stars like Friday the 13th's Jason Voorhees, The Predator, and Texas Chainsaw Massacre's Leatherface. Countless different costumes, classic fatalities, stages, and more would also be made available post-launch, keeping the scene alive and well for months to come. Plus, one specific outfit dresses up Jax as Carl Weather. You son of a bitch. That's the best fucking piece of DLC ever made for any game ever. You son of a bitch. Fighting games are always kind of a player versus player deal, but outside of multiplayer, Mortal Kombat X has an insane amount of single player content. There's the story mode, the regular arcade ladder, the challenge towers, the living towers which update daily, hourly, to give you brand new things to do. The fun with Mortal Kombat X is virtually endless. Mortal Kombat X exploded the series in popularity, possibly bringing it to an all time new level. The reviews were great. The sales figures were even better, and Mortal Kombat fans were once again left at the edge of their seat, eagerly awaiting the next installment. And that brings us to today. If you're watching this right around the time it went live, it's probably early December 2018. But just to be clear, I wrote this script and recorded this piece of footage on November 14th, 2018. So if something insane has happened in the meantime, Fuck me, I guess. But I think the question on everybody's minds now is, what is the future of Mortal Kombat? We've gone through the entire history of the franchise, chronicling more than 26 years worth of fatalities. We've seen the highest highs and the lowest lows. We've talked about playground memories, arcade discoveries, and everything in between. If the recent release history is to be believed, Mortal Kombat 11 should be right around the corner. Mortal Kombat 9, the reboot, launched in 2011. Mortal Kombat X followed four years later in 2015. NetherRealm are a busy studio, having their hands full with the stellar DC Comics fighting franchise Injustice between MK titles, but that four year window is quickly closing. Is it possible, or rather, likely, that we see MK11 in 2019? My guess would be yes. Ed Boon has continued to troll fans and games media over the last several months, as usual, but nothing concrete has emerged. Now, I also think there's a possibility that somewhere down the line, Netherrealm could flex their WB muscles and instead make a game with an all-star cast of characters borrowed from other franchises, but that's just me throwing ideas out into the void. I think it's fair to say that Mortal Kombat fans would be disappointed by that, but I don't think anyone can tell me a game featuring characters Netherrealm has previously borrowed wouldn't be fucking awesome. Across Mortal Kombat and Injustice, that roster already consists of Alien, Predator, Freddy Krueger, Jason Voorhees, Leatherface, Kratos, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Hellboy, and more. Keep digging the WB catalog and we could have Pennywise from IT, who could have an insane moveset. Hell, let's make it a fucking party! Do an open world RPG featuring characters from Looney Tunes, Mortal Kombat, DC Comics, horror franchises, PlayStation and Xbox staples, more. It could be insane, absolutely ridiculous, with no point to it at all. Or maybe that's what Kingdom Hearts already is, I don't know. Relax, that was a joke. I'm kidding about the RPG, but for real. Rather than going all in on what Mortal Kombat 11 will be, let's just agree that we're all waiting with bated breath. You can find story speculation on any message board or subreddit, and I encourage you to do so, 
because taking part in those conversations can be a lot of fun. But I don't want to close this documentary on a mountain of maybes. I'd rather share a story with you guys that really drives home what Mortal Kombat means to me. When I was really young, my dad worked overnights loading and unloading trucks in the sweltering heat and the blistering cold. He'd wake up late, sometimes 10pm, sometimes 1am, sometimes later, preparing to start his day on a timeline the polar opposite of everyone else in the house. I was 5, maybe 6, my brother 7 or 8. Sometimes we'd stay up way past our bedtime playing Mortal Kombat on Sega Genesis, muffling our roars of victory as to not ruin our late night scheme. When my dad woke up, before jumping in the shower, he'd always crack our door open to check on us. If we were caught in the act, he'd usually give us a stern warning of, You've got school tomorrow, go to bed! But sometimes he'd crack the door open, watch us for a second, and say, I get the winner. He wasn't a gamer at all, rather a fisherman and a general outdoorsman, but there were times where he could take us down. There was a rule though, no special moves on dad. If we ever hit him with a freeze attack or scorpion spear, that was it. Come on, damn it! knock that shit off, I don't know those moves. Every once in a while he'd accidentally pull one off on his own, and if we protested, he'd always respond the same way. Tough shit. My dad passed away in March of 2017, and of all the memories I have of him, playing Mortal Kombat on Sega Genesis way past our bedtime is one of my favorites. I'm trying my best to keep it together recording these voiceovers, but trust me, it hurts writing this script. I wish I could play this video for him and see his reaction. I'm not a religious man at all, but hopefully, one way or another, he knows what I'm up to, and he's a fan. Memories like that are why I've said across this entire documentary that Mortal Kombat is way more than blood and guts to me. I've watched this series and these characters grow across these last nearly 30 years, and I myself have personally grown quite a bit along with them. Mortal Kombat means more to me than ABAC ABB. Mortal Kombat reminds me of my childhood. Mortal Kombat reminds me of being in high school. Mortal Kombat reminds me of this very day. This was the history of Mortal Kombat, guys, and I hope you enjoyed watching it as much as I enjoyed writing it, filming it, editing it, and going back and playing these games, because I had a fucking blast. Mortal Kombat! The recent release history is to be believed, Mortal Kombat 11 should be right around the corner. See? I told you it was right around the corner. I could not have timed the release of the final installment of my History of Mortal Kombat documentary any better. The channel has gone from 600 something subscribers to nearly 30,000 subscribers in the span of just over one month. It's pretty clear you guys are MK diehards, and it's pretty clear that even though my series has reached its end, you guys want more. As an obvious Mortal Kombat mark myself, that's fine with me. I'll continue to deliver the MK goods amongst my other videos, and I hope you guys stick around for the long haul. Without further ado, let's get into this Mortal Kombat 11 business. Revealing Mortal Kombat 11 unexpectedly and playing it off as if it were simply the wrong clip for the award show wasn't only a 10 out of 10 troll, it was possibly the most Ed Boon thing any of us have ever seen. Actually, sorry about that, I think they played the wrong video. Um. Ed is a trolling mastermind, and this did not disappoint. What did disappoint some, though, was the trailer itself. And no, I don't mean it disappointed because the game didn't look good. What I mean is that some viewers could not fucking stand the musical choice, which was 21 Savage's original track, Immortal. You a shit talker, we got done for that. Trying to fix fight, boy, you done for that. Stupid, you gonna get a bullet in your lung for that. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't like it either. I don't think the audio fits the visuals at all. I don't even like this type of music. Like, at all. I think there's 763,234 songs that probably would have fit better. But, with that said, who gives a shit what song they chose for the trailer? The hatred and vitriol I was seeing on every single MK11 post was embarrassing. It really bothers me when someone puts together something that's awesome, presents it to the world, and 85% of the comments are focused on what the viewer didn't like about it. 
It drives me nuts. Especially when it's something like Mortal Kombat 11, a game that had been anticipated for years. And rather than commenting, oh man, this looks awesome. What's up with the multiple scorpions? Is there a time travel mechanic? I don't like the song. The fatalities are awesome. It simply gets whittled down to, song is trash, SMH. I hate this. I hate it worse than the song choice, to be honest with you. And not only that, but it's not like the song is setting the tone for what MK11 is going to be through and through. Did everyone forget the Wiz Khalifa MKX trailer? I'ma tell you that you're not my competition. I'ma always win. Throw me in, and I'm going in. I ain't running. I'ma come and tell you when you might get to talk about it because I really live it. Part of nights on the mission. The game dropped. The song was nowhere to be found. And Mortal Kombat X was awesome. Get over it. Moving on though, January 17th, 2019 gave us our first real in-depth look at Mortal Kombat 11 through the official community reveal. First and foremost, let's talk about the story. Predictably, we are picking up right where MKX left off. Shinnok is defeated. Raiden has been corrupted by the Jinsei and has taken the role of Dark Raiden. Mortal Kombat Deception. And this cool bald lady who controls the entire universe just showed up. Wait, what? Introducing Kronika, ladies and gentlemen. She's not only the first female main boss we've ever had in a Mortal Kombat game, but according to Netherrealm, she's been pulling the strings in the universe the whole time. She's only made herself known now because Raiden has gone and fucked up her entire plan, having shifted the tides of war too far in the good side's favor. I'm not sure if she's straight up evil or if she's got more of a Thanos complex, and that I mean she might believe that what she's about to do is not evil, and that even though presumably millions of people could die, she believes what she's doing is for the greater good of the universe. Time will tell on Kronika and her motivations, and I'm along for the ride. I do wonder though how this whole time angle is going to play out. If we're being realistic, we just had a time travel angle in Mortal Kombat 9. We relived the first three games, we saw younger versions of the fighters we all know and love. MK11 seems like it's setting itself apart by not simply traveling back in time, but more bending the idea of time and overlapping different destinies. The story details were actually very light, in my opinion. Netherrealm didn't show us too much, which I really appreciate. I hate spoilers for one, to the point that I will usually avoid trailers to movies I'm anticipating seeing as to not have huge moments ruined for me. Yeah, I'm that guy. So we've met Kronika and have been given the elevator pitch on the outline of the plot, but that's about it. We were introduced to Garrus, who we can only assume is Kronika's big scary friend, and unlike Kronika, we saw gameplay of Garrus, who seems to have abilities based on the sands of time. I was getting major Tremor vibes from his spikes and blunt objects formed from sand, and that is not a bad thing. Garrus looks dope, and he's a character that I am definitely looking forward to learning more about. Oh, and what the hell was that thing that rushed past the screen? That blur over the logo? Cabal seems to make the most sense, but like you guys, I really have no clue, but I'm excited to find out. And yes, I was hoping for some Shaolin Monks type story mode gameplay myself, but it was not to be. At least, not yet. Fingers crossed though, we have plenty of time before the full game drops. There were some very interesting shots shown in some of the story mode footage, specifically of Liu Kang and Kung Lao traveling together, so yeah, fingers crossed. Real quick though, while we're at it, I want to say that I'm aware that there are some supposed roster leaks and whatnot out there, some of which have been publicly dispelled by Ed Boon himself. I want to make it clear that I have not and will not be looking at or covering any of those leaks. I love the suspense, I love a good surprise. So if there are rumors and stuff that you want me to speculate on, that is not my style. There are a million YouTubers who can form together 10 minutes of saying absolutely nothing about things they have zero real knowledge on. And if that's what you're looking for, you have to go to one of their channels. I'm not going to do it. We were served up a shitload of gameplay, which was all looking fantastic. We've now gotten a look at Scorpion, Sub-Zero, Liu Kang, Raiden, Sonya Blade, the returning Baraka and Scarlet, and the aforementioned Garrus. Each and every fighter now comes complete with custom variation slots, meaning that we the player can put our money where our mouths are to create not only the best looking, but best feeling version of each character on the roster. Want to change Scorpion's mask? Go for it. Tired of that same old spear? Upgrade it. I had an absolute blast customizing my Superman when I played Injustice 2, and having the same opportunity to create my own versions of Sub-Zero and the other members of the MK roster is something I am really, really looking forward to. What kind of plans do you guys have for your favorite fighters? Pitch me some ideas in the comments. And hey, while we're talking roster, I'm a fan of Ronda Rousey as Sonya Blade. First of all, Ronda's dope. Second of all, Sonya looks and sounds different all the time. 
so it's not really going to be disrupting anything from a canonical standpoint. I think she makes for a cool addition to the history of Mortal Kombat. But hey, side note, did anyone notice the complete lack of combat kids at the event? I sure did. I would imagine some of the kids will make the final roster when it's all said and done. They were the main focus of Mortal Kombat X after all. Fatalities were on full display and I don't think any of us were pissed off about that. Sonya Blade calls in the help of her trusty helicopter. Scorpion uses the chains of his spear to split you in half starting right at the old unmentionables. And Scarlet is impaling you with spikes made of your own blood. I've got to give the death medal, that's M-E-D-A-L, to Baraka though. Face? Rip it off. Skull? Break it open. Brain? Shish kebab that motherfucker and eat it like we're at an MK barbecue. That is hardcore. It's good to have our tar cotton friend back after all these years, isn't it? As far as I can tell, x-ray moves are gone, replaced instead with the new fatal blow mechanic. Once the 30% health ratio has been reached, the fatal blow becomes available. I don't know how you guys feel about this, but I think I like it. X-rays were cool, don't get me wrong, but seeing them two to three times in each and every battle was a bit tiresome after a while. Plus, connecting with a desperation x-ray only to have your opponent walk it off and come back to beat your ass again is not a very good feeling. A move that nasty looking should have deadly implications, and I feel like fatal blows are a step in the right direction. We have so much more to learn about MK11, but until more information is released, let's speed through some of the other little bits and bobs we picked up from the community event. Did you guys notice Johnny Cage hanging out in the military hangar? Did you notice there are 17 stage slots, or that the roster screen has 24 spaces on it? Did you notice the secret frame that flashed at the 24 minute mark of the stream? It looked like this. That's weird, right? Mortal Kombat 11 is shaping up to be what professionals in the field call fucking awesome. The story has me sucked in, the roster is comprised so far of a mixture of all-time favorites and brand new bosses, the fatalities are looking creative and disgusting, and we're just scratching the surface. I cannot wait for more info on MK11, and I can't wait to see what you guys think in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and have a good night.